Boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome here in the section room of the Portuguese Academy of Sciences. I should have said Lisbon Academy of Sciences. Although, although it is, the official name is Lisbon, in fact, the content is Portuguese Academy of Sciences. So it's just a question of an old name that has a lot of traditions and we didn't dare change it. Uh, I'm sorry, I like to start in time. This is, this is a long session, and so I will go straight away to our colleague Pombeiro, who will make a short presentation of each of any uh, of each of the of the speakers. Please, Pombeiro. Just ask you one question. Make uh, one point. Make sure you get very close to the micro, so that the um, session can be properly recorded, your voice included. Not only the pictures, but your voice included. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the nice introduction. <coughs> well, I would like to start by thanking the Academy, of course, for this initiative to invite the se session of chemistry to organize, to try to organize a special session devoted to uh, the 25th anniversary, celebration of 21st anniversary of the periodic table, yeah. So this is a very, a very important topic, undoubtedly, for systematization of chemistry and also for science. And so I think the, in this way the Academy joins also to this initiative. So that there will be three sessions. This is the first one dealing with catalysis. And then others will continue in one week and in two, two weeks' time. Yeah? And they will devote to other points. One of them is to carbon. That's an essential element of the periodic table. And the other one will be on assemblies, multinuclear assemblies with different applications. And for instance, for materials and for uh, biological applications as well, medicinal and so on. So this is the first one. And uh, as you know, is really uh, focus on catalysis. And catalysis really is a very important topic, field, and uh, uh, to summarize the, role, uh, the relevance of catalysis, I can use just one sentence. That was written, it appeared in a report of the US um, Energy Department. That is, catalysis constitutes the greatest contribution of chemistry towards sustainable development for the human welfare. This is, well, roughly what is written there. And so in this simple sentence you can see the relevance of the topic that we are going to discuss today. So we have three speakers. They are all members, uh, corresponding members of our academy, and then I will close the session. Uh, each of them will, well, last, the duration will be about, about just 30 minutes, yeah, in order, otherwise the session will go very long. And I suggest, in order to save time, that you will keep your questions for the end. And so I think we could have, if you agree, we could have the four uh, presentations and then you could, in the end, have an overall discussion of that. So the first speaker is, I'm very pleased to, to uh, uh, present to you Professor Pierre Braunstein. He is from uh, Strasbourg, Strasbourg, from the University of Strasbourg, and I have a couple of notes here. He has been always in Strasbourg, except for one year, when he was in London with Sir Nyholm, uh, and also another one with Professor E. O. Fischer, Nobel Prize of Chemistry and in, in Germany. Yeah. He is now Emeritus, Emeritus Research Director, and uh, he has, well, a huge number of distinctions for his honorary professor of numerous universities in China that he is visiting very frequently, and his main research are in inorganic organometallic chemistry of the transition and main group elements. Uh, I know some of you are not chemists, but for chemists this is uh, some meaning, some important meaning, yeah. He has co-authored of over 600 scientific publications and a number of uh, a few books that he edited as well. And he presented about 500 plenary keynote and invited talks at conferences and institutions, yeah. He is a member of the French Académie des Sciences, of the German National Academy of Science, Leo, the Leopoldina, and foreign corresponding member of our Academy, and also of the Academy of Science of Zaragoza. And uh, he has had a chemistry vision of the European Academy of Sciences. 
uh, and uh, his contacts with uh, Portugal uh, have also uh, been, uh, uh, well, for a considerable time, and he is a member of the External Advisory Board uh, of the CQE, that's our research center at IST, uh, my research center of chemistry, Centro de Química Estrutural. So we also, we have a collaboration also under this. So Pierre, please, this is, we are looking forward to you. Should I stand by the microphone? Is it a must? Or am I free to move around? Right, okay. Okay, usually my voice is strong enough, but I would like first to thank Amanda for his very kind introduction and for taking this initiative of having a session devoted to chemistry here in this prestigious academy, and I'm very pleased and honored to be here. Thank you, Mr. President, for hosting this event um, in this prestigious building. Your academy will celebrate at Christmas its 240th anniversary, if I'm counting right, which is quite a memorable event already. And uh, I think chemistry, of course, deserves a special treatment in that specific year where we celebrate the periodic table. Um, it is, of course, a challenge to have a meeting organized open to non-chemists, but it's very good for us to have the stimulus from non-chemists as part of the audience. Of course, um, yes, I don't know why sometimes the top is cut and sometimes not, so maybe I can slide quickly do something about it. It will work out. So anyway, you, you recognize, of course, the, the periodic table in its original form and in a more modern one. Uh, this is an icon of chemistry, an icon of science in general. And almost for everyone who went to school, they heard at least once in their life about the existence of the periodic table. And in this book, called in French, Principe de Chimie, Mendeleev explains in this book that is key to his success he was not the first, nor the last, to be concerned with classifying elements. That was his talent to compare halogen with alkali metals. And that was instrumental in his discovery. And he quotes here, around 1860, the ground was already fully prepared for this law. And if it was only stated later, the cause lies, in my opinion, in comparing similar elements with each other, leaving aside dissimilar elements. We are therefore very far away from a single intuition. Rather, Mendeleev capitalized on past work from previous scientists that he acknowledges very, very nicely indeed. Nowadays, we know that the periodic table is everywhere, including when you start the day. And this is something not to be forgotten. I come from a part of France which is represented here on the east part, close to Germany and Switzerland, Alsace. And south of Alsace, there is a small town, 100,000 inhabitants, Mulhouse, which is very famous for museums, car, textile, trains, but also for being the birthplace of Alfred Werner. I don't know what to do about cutting the head. I mean, the guillotine time is over, but still, <laughs> Alfred Werner is shown here. He was born in Mulhouse, and he is the founder of coordination chemistry. That's why he got the Nobel Prize in 1913, after he had joined Zurich. Now, ligands and metals, this is really the basic concept on which Werner made his pioneering work. What are ligands? What are metals? Metals, you know. Ligands are small molecules attached to the metals. We just call them ligands. And they can be of any type. So this is a very broad definition. And basically, ligands and metals constitutes for molecular chemists a toolbox with which you can play ad infinitum. There is basically no limitation in the game except your own imagination. The ligands can be organic or inorganic. It can be a small molecule, a small atom, a sulfur, an oxygen atom. It can be a ligand for the metal in metal oxides or metal sulfides. It can be a very complex organic molecule, a natural product, can attach to metal. Think of hemoglobin, ligands around the iron center that define the property of hemoglobin. And the ligands will interact with metals to give molecules. And the metals, again, 
can be any from the periodic table that we're celebrating today or this year. And of course, the metal cores can have any nuclearity. One metal center, this is what we call mononuclear chemistry. Polymetallic clusters have many atoms, metal atoms connected to each other to form the core of the molecule with the ligand around at the periphery. And they can be all the same elements or mixed metals in heterometallic systems. So we're really, really illustrating here the strength of the periodic table. You can choose elements according to the properties you may anticipate. And these metal cores, just illustrated here, can be so already complex systems, like this tribethenium, dodecacarbonyl. It is a triangular core of three metal atoms forming a triangle, connected by metal-metal bonds. This has nothing to do with the metallic bond of a ruthenium piece of metal. This is a molecular compound. Likewise here, this beautiful compound coming from Italy, where you have a huge octahedron of nickel atoms, and in the middle, a small platinum octahedron embedded in the structure of this nickel superoctahedron. I think aesthetically very pleasing molecule. Also others which have more complicated structure, like one we found with palladium and manganese, which if you just look at the structure for the double helix type structure, the red helix, which is orthogonal <coughs> to the blue helix, total accidental discovery. There was no plan, no master plan. And if you had asked me how to design such a molecule, I would have been totally incapable of doing that. Just serendipity is a big help in science. So these ligands and metals can allow you to generate chemical synthesis, chemical compounds, and often to design molecular architecture, although we have to be very careful. Often design is overused. We are very much lucky in serendipity, in finding that happened beyond our will. Of course, you may have a master plan, but often things are different from what we anticipated. Incidentally, this is often what I find the most exciting development, when what you get is not what you anticipated. But funding agencies don't like that. They want a master plan. <laughs> With this design, you can achieve the design of new molecules, new chemical bonds, connecting the elements together. Even today, not all the elements of the periodic table have been connected to each other directly. There are still holes in the catalog of chemical bonds, which seems very strange, but this is very interesting. We can discover new reactions, develop strategies and concepts. And this molecule will have functions which can be chemical, magnetic, photophysical, name it, and applications ranging from catalysis, fine chemicals, drug design, nanomaterials, etc. One area which has developed tremendously that Werner probably would not have anticipated are the application of these compounds to catalysis. Catalysis was mentioned here before as a key component of new ways to save resources and save energy. If you remember, sorry, that's uh, something I cannot do much about, maybe by lifting the, the, the projector at the back a little bit. Uh, what, what, what are the, uh, the top is a function of the catalyst. The function of the catalyst, if you first remember what the reaction pathway is, you start from two products, A plus B, that would give the product C plus D. It doesn't go through a straight line, it goes through some activation energy, an intermediate, another activation energy, and to the final product, which is thermodynamically preferred, otherwise you would not have the reaction. In a city like Lisbon, there is no need to dwell on the hills and the importance of hill and going over the hills. What is going over the hill is going through the activation energy. And what does a catalyst? It minimizes the energy profile. Instead of having to go uphill, you can find a shorter way, less costly in energy, like going on this path here, instead of going to the summit of the mountains. That's what the catalyst does. It cannot change the thermodynamics, it will alter the kinetics. So this is, of course, a very important element to think about. Now, over the years, catalysis has occupied basically all the fields of chemistry, ranging from homogeneous catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis, supported catalysis, biological enzyme catalysis, etc. And basically now it's estimated that 85 percent of the chemical processes in the industry are run catalytically, which is a very high percentage, with a ratio heterogeneous to homogeneous about three to one. Homogeneous catalysis, and here are some reactions listed, hydroformulation, carbonylation, oxidation, etc., 
have become very successful in industry because of a much better understanding of the basic chemistry associated with the development of this catalyst. It has to go through optimization, but not random. We have to understand the basic principle. And that explains why catalysis has become so successful in industry. Just to give one example, in oxocatalysis, which provides a lot of very important chemical compounds, has improved in the last 50 years by a factor of 10,000, which is absolutely huge. By having continuous plant operation, replacement of cobalt as a catalyst by rhodium, although rhodium is more expensive, Industry found that was a much better solution to the problem, tailoring the ligand sphere, etc. So this is a huge factor, a huge gain over the years, happening through constant progress, basic understanding of science, and the development of new catalysts. <coughs> catalysis has been highlighted a few times for Nobel laureates. Here, when you see the catalysis prize, the, cat the chemistry Nobel Prize awarded to Shova, Grubbs, and Schrock for the development of metathesis reaction, which is a reaction transforming two olefins with A, B, and C, D substituents into two new olefins where the substituents have exchanged. This is a major discovery which has encountered considerable amount of application. Another set of Nobel laureates for chemistry based because of the work they did on catalysis by Heck, Nagish, and Suzuki with palladium catalysis, palladium metal here, allows this ethylene molecule to get close to the metal center, and therefore close to the aryl ring, the benzene ring here, attached to palladium, and allow the formation of a carbon-carbon bond here. CC coupling is key to organic chemistry. So these cases were very good illustrations of the impact of catalysis. For the tailoring of the ligands that we mentioned earlier, we have there are sets of ligands that we call hybrid. I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't know why I can't get rid of this thing, which I don't have on the screen here. So this red line on the top, I mean, I don't know. So we, there are a set of ligands which we call heterofunctional of, or hybrid ligands. And I will spend the rest of the time illustrating for you some applications of these hybrid ligands and tell you what they are, first to define them. And then to show you that we can use them for various purposes. The first one, would be to control the metal coordination sphere in order to better control the molecular properties of the compound in which these hybrid ligands are present. So what are these hybrid ligands? Just imagine you have a ligand which has two donor groups, red, red, Y, Y, and another set, two blue donor groups, which are the same. A hybrid would basically be a ligand that derives from the two parents to give a child here hoping that the child will combine the best properties from the two parents. This is what every parent hopes for his children. You, can, you have to be optimistic in science, that the hybrid ligand really will have new properties that none of the parents have. With that, you can develop new chemistry. And very easily, you can see that if you have the red-red ligand attached to the metal center, the two positions in the metal coordination sphere opposite to the red donors are identical by symmetry. This is what you would call a degenerate situation. There is no way you can differentiate one site over the other. But chemistry is often about selectivity. So here you have a problem, because you cannot easily differentiate the two sites A and A here. Likewise here, in front of the two blue donor groups, you have two B groups which are identical by symmetry. But that's very easy to resolve, because if you now have a hybrid ligand, the two positions, A and B, are now different because they're chemically differentiated by the presence of the blue and the red donor atoms, which have different trans arrangements. So that's a very easy way, conceptually, to lift this degeneracy and therefore bring about selectivity, hopefully, in the following reactions. So that raises a number of questions about the selectivity of the metal ligand interactions, whether the ligand will actually chelate the metal center or bridge between two metal centers, whether you have synergistic effect between the ligand and the metals, a lot of concepts very much used in chemistry these days. I don't have the time to illustrate that for you in detail. And also the possibility that this DY ligand will be dynamic on the NMR time scale, nuclear magnetic resonance, basically the opening of the chelate reversibly, which has a very strong impact in catalysis. I will illustrate for you a series of ligands 
phosphenoindolates that were studied almost 35 years ago or more. And I will explain to you why I'm going back in the dinosaur times. This is a palladium compound, which has a square planar environment. Basically, all the donor atoms are in the plane of the screen. The yellow serrated carbon and the nitrogen here represent this chelating ligand, derived from dimethylbenzylamine or 8-methylquinoin. They just stabilize the palladium center. They are what we call spectator ligands. They don't do anything in the reaction. They just sit there, watch the train pass, and stabilize the metal center. The active part is on the other side. This is a phosphenoenolate. Organic chemists among you will recognize this fragment as being an enolate, which has a very characteristic NMR resonance for the proton at 315. So this is a five-membered ring chelate. We know that it's going to be stable. But surprisingly, this turned out to be highly reactive. Stability is a thermodynamic concept. Reactivity is a kinetic concept. They may not go together. We found, and that, that was an accidental discovery, you have to be lucky in life again, that carbon dioxide at room temperature, atmospheric pressure, would be captured by this molecule to give you this compound that could be isolated and characterized by X-ray diffraction. What has happened? You see we have formed the carbon-carbon bond here between the carbon of the indolate and the CO2. And the oxygen atoms are stabilized by palladium here and by the proton there, the proton that has migrated from this carbon to that oxygen-centered ring system. And the NMR chemical shift is close to 14, very different from the precursor. So that's easy to see. That was not planned. I would never have predicted that a stable palladium compound would react with carbon dioxide. More interestingly, the reaction is reversible. If you bubble nitrogen or argon through a solution of this complex, you turn back to the starting material within a couple of seconds. And you can repeat the cycle as long as your PhD student is willing to do the game. <laughs> so that raised a number of questions. This is the first example of CO2 fixation by carbon-carbon bond formation. And CC bond formation, as I mentioned earlier, this is key to many organic transformations. And that, of course, triggered the study of the mechanism. We think that the CO2 is activated both by the nucleophilic carbon and by the electrophilic metal center. Nowadays, there is a very popular term that is a synergism between the ligand and the metals. You see that here both the metal and the ligand intervene in the activation of the small molecule. There is a synergistic effect here, which is absolutely obvious. That raises the question, what can we do with this palladium compound able to, to, to fix CO2 reversibly? There was a possibility, looking at the patent literature, to react butadiene and carbon dioxide in the presence of palladium catalysts to form this heterocyclic compound, which is called a delta lactone. And you see the delta lactone, the two oxygen atoms of CO2 have been retained. So formally, you don't need to reduce carbon dioxide. You just functionalize an organic molecule with carbon dioxide. There are very few examples. Of course, aspirin synthesis is one of them, but not so many examples where you can transfer CO2 into the final product. This would, of course, be very interesting because you don't need to pay the price for the reduction. These delta lactones actually, incidentally, have a very nice smell. Sometimes we like to smell the compounds we make. Maybe it is tricky sometimes, but here's a nice smell. So, uh, chemistry doesn't always smell bad. It can smell very good. You find this building block in many perfumes and etc. So the question is, if you run this reaction, it is known that you can form a diversity of compounds. The delta lactone I just mentioned, plus other heterocycle, carboxylic acid, esters. And the problem is selectivity. You don't want to have a dozen compounds formed in your reaction, because that means you have to separate them. And industry doesn't like separation, because this is costly. You prefer to have a target one compound if possible. So selectivity is a big issue. That's what we worked on, and eventually we developed a catalyst that would give you this delta lactone in about 50% yield, but most importantly, 96% selectivity. So we're quite happy with this. We tried to find applications, talking with polymer chemists about this delta lactone. There was nothing happening. 
And I had a very good colleague in Germany with a strong link with a major industrial company. I said, you know, what can they do with this compound? I said, well, so far they said no application. I was a bit frustrated, but that was the state of the art. About two years ago, a very good friend of mine, and I thought, we all know him very well, Matthias Beller in Rostock in Germany, a brilliant chemist, studied again the same reaction. Taking, again, palladium with different ligands, which are characterized by a phosphorus donor group, or phosphines, and an oxygen functionality. A methoxy group in the phenyl ring, or this phosphine here, which has again a methoxy group in that position. And he found that this, this, this ligand here, L14, a methoxy phosphine, or that one, he could get the delta lactone I have just shown you before, in about 60 to 70% yield, which is slightly better than what we had, but the selectivity was not improved compared with what we had. However, this is just to show you how currently important CO2 chemistry remains. even made the cover of cat chem cat with this reaction. It's just to show you that sometimes you have to be patient in life. The work we did 35 years ago is still considered to be of importance today. I would have preferred to find applications earlier on, but that's the state of the art. A couple of years ago, Kyoko Nozaki in Japan found a way to actually make use of this lactone by radical polymerization to form now polymers that contain the building block we have just seen before. So there is perhaps a possibility now to use that in polymer chemistry. Again, this was paid, paid, published in Nature Chemistry in uh, about two, two, three years ago. So that shows the time scale. Sometimes things develop very quickly, sometimes it needs a long time for maturing. Interestingly enough, these phosphenoindolates can find a range of applications just depending on the metal here. That again illustrates the diversity of the periodic table. If you have palladium in the middle, this is the chemistry I've just shown you here. But if you have nickel in the middle, you have a fantastic catalyst developed by the Shell Company to oligomerize ethylene into oligomers, or short chain, not polymers, shorter chain, which has a big industrial success. If you have rhodium in the middle, and the same PO type ligand here, you can activate alkanes, known to be very, very inert compounds, hard to activate. If you have ruthenium, you can transfer hydrogen from isopropanol to ketones. So the same ligand here plays a fantastic role by just changing the metal, you enter into different kind of chemistries. Let me show you now with a couple of examples how you can use these hybrid ligands to control the formation of nanomaterials from molecular precursors. We start from molecules and we go towards nanomaterials. Again, let's think of the clusters I have shown you at the beginning. Ruthenium 3CO12, three metal atoms, a tetrahedron of cobalt atoms in cobalt 4CO12, an octahedron of rhodium atoms in rhodium 6 co 16 For those who are quick at counting electrons, all the metals here are in the zero valent state, zero valent, like in the metal, but metal surrounded by ligand shell to protect. But basically, you can view these compounds as a small piece of metal surrounded by ligands. But of course, the ligands will make this compound soluble in dichlomethane, soluble in acetone, what a piece of rhodium or a piece of cobalt, of course, is not. So it changes completely the properties. We're talking here about molecules. So the idea that we developed a long time ago was to think about using these molecules as precursors to metal particles. By removing the ligands, carbon monoxide is a fairly lay-by ligand. By thermal treatment, you can remove it, hoping to retain the core, which is a metal particle, and remove the ligand, what I often call that the molecular striptease. But you hope that the core at the end is identical with what you had at the beginning. That is the assumption, but it has to be demonstrated. You can make the game a little more tricky if the metal core contains two different metals, cobalt and rhodium, or cobalt and ruthenium, and do the same thing. Now the question is, if I remove my ligands, Will I retain an alloy type particle where the two metals are still together, like in an alloy? Or will we have phase segregation? Each metal goes its own way. We have metals that do not form alloys in the bulk. 
You cannot form an alloy between, let's say, gold and ruthenium. But we can make molecular clusters where gold and ruthenium interact closely. So the almost close to philosophical question is, if they get married in the molecular state, gold and ruthenium, if I increase the size of the particle, what will happen? So they say, hey, wait a minute. I'm no longer a molecule, I've become a piece of metal. We're not allowed to get married, let's face segregate. But how long does they retain the memory of the molecule? This is the big interesting question. Why? Because this can have an impact on catalysis. How can biometallic particles be controlled in terms of size and composition? Can we generate molecular alloys, quote, that could lead to biometallic particles that you could not access otherwise for thermodynamic reasons? But you can kinetically trap this molecular alloy. That could be very promising for molecular catalysis, for heterogeneous catalysis. You can put these small particles in various supports, mesoporous, microporous supports, and you can anchor, attach these molecules to the support to have an even better control. That's what I want to try to illustrate for you. So the precursor is one of the clusters I have just shown you. And what we want to do is a matrix which is a porous material, a porous silica, obtained by, as a zero gel, which is a porous structure. You impregnate a solution of the compound into the porous material, you thermally treat it, you remove the ligands, and you hope to have small metal particles stabilized, embedded into this, 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 this support here. And we wanted to start from low oxidation state metal precursors to avoid redox reactions that could be drastically affecting the fate of the metal core. So we start from low oxidation state to get metal particles which are also in the low oxidation state. We don't want to be bothered with redox chemistry here. So we started from a palladium molybdenum cluster that we made in our group a long time ago as a precursor to hopefully bimetallic palladium and molybdenum mixed metal particles. For that, we wanted to test a chemical reaction that would be meaningful. The chemical reaction was the following. You take aromatic nitro compounds, like nitrobenzene, carbon monoxide, gives an intermediate isocyanates, which are very important precursors to polymers, polyurethane, etc., and carbon dioxide. So the question is, does this bimetallic catalyst do any better job than palladium alone or molybdenum alone? So that's why we compared, that was the collaboration with industry, and we found eventually that this cluster derived bimetallic particles were performing much, much better than conventional heterogeneous catalysts, or that palladium alone, or molybdenum alone, which means you need both metals to achieve these transformations with high selectivity, high conversion, which was a nice evidence of this cluster derived catalyst being sometimes much better performing than conventional catalysts. Initially, this area looked a bit strange. I had many friends asking me, Pierre, are you crazy? You spend your time making nice molecules, and now you want to decompose them thermally. Are you crazy? I say, yeah, you never know. Maybe you get something even more exciting. Now, recently, we reviewed this area again in 2015, and the last time I reviewed the topic, it's booming. There's just too many references, hundreds of references have appeared. Lots of people are really working in this field, which is a good sign, but very difficult to have an overview anymore. You can also use other supports instead of just a silica gel. You can use an organized silica, so-called mesoporous silica, which have these acronyms based on the companies that develop them. Basically, you have here pores viewed from the top, which have a certain diameter. And the challenge is to put the molecule in the diameter and to see whether you can control the size. Think of cannellonis that you want to fill with something and hope that the cannelloni structure will retain so that the inside cannot grow bigger than the diameter of your cannelloni. And we started from that with a tetrahedral cluster which contained ruthenium or, or iron and cobalt in the basal plate, as this is a tetrahedral system that we want to incorporate into this mesoporous material for magnetic properties, for catalysis, and various things. Now we thought instead of just having a weak interaction that you do, but you have just impregnation, we wanted to have a ligand to attach this, uh, li this cluster to the surface of your support by covalent bonding. So the link you have to develop here is based on ligands. 
And this is basically how we proceed. You take a diphosphine ligand, the green part, to which you attach a functionality that will be interacting with the support to give a hybrid type ligand, phosphines, and, and silicon alkoxides. We could actually make such compounds where you see the cluster, some represented here without the ligand, the so diphosphine stabilizing an edge of the tetrahedron, connecting to the matrix here, so that you have a stronger anchoring, so hopefully a better control of the dispersity of the molecules on the support. This is the top view of the support, the 10 image of MCM41 coming from mobile co composition, SBA15, Santa Barbara, and you see a very well organized porous system in which you want to fill the pores with your molecules. Eventually, we could demonstrate the feasibility. Here are the tetrahedral compounds attached to the surface here through the linker I have just shown you. And the next step was to thermally activate and the hydrogen to remain the oxidation state. We don't want to make oxide. And the hydrogen, and we got by surprise a cobalt phosphide phase. We initially targeted cobalt nanoparticles, but we got cobalt phosphide. And the compound, where did it come from? Of course, the, comp the phosphorus comes from the phosphines, which under thermal conditions got degraded and formed a phase autorhombic cobalt 2P, which is the cobalt phosphide which was not really anticipated, but we could understand afterwards quite easily why it formed. If you look here at the transmission electromicroscope image of this material, you see here the chain, these are, these are the candelones, basically, and the little black spots here are the nanoparticles inside the candelone. And if you look at the di diameter, you see there is a fairly narrow distribution with a size of about six nanometers, which is a maximum, and which corresponds exactly to the diameter of the candelone. So indeed, we could sort of target the dimension of the particles by the matrix effect of the environment in which we developed the nanoparticles. So uh, to be sure that it is really inside the pores, we have here a tomography, which is a view of the cavity, the beige thing. The red spots are gold particles of known size to calibre. And the blue little spot that you will see appearing here are our nanoparticles. And they are indeed in the cavity and not outside or at the surface. So this is really an interesting experiment showing you that indeed you've been able to embed these nanoparticles in the matrix. So these molecular precursors have allowed us to generate nanoparticles, nanomaterials that otherwise would not be easy to generate under controlled conditions. So the functionalities here of the ligands has allowed covalent grafting of the clusters on the supports, and you achieve therefore a better distribution of size and, 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 and distribution. We started from a bottom-up approach. We start from the molecule, we functionalize it, we anchor, and we generate the nanoparticles. So we always start from the molecule to really understand at the molecular level as much as possible. Now, this phase is interesting in its own right as a paramagnetic material, which can be now achieved in much lower temperature than classical solid state synthesis would require. An application in catalysis have already been demonstrated by various groups, not by us, but by other groups. Electronic properties also seem to be quite promising. So basically, this bottom-up approach for molecules to materials allows you to achieve a huge diversity of new materials or of known materials under much milder conditions, which is, of course, interesting. But all that is based on really a better understanding of the molecular chemistry. You need to understand where you start from. You need to understand the pieces of the Lego that you want to assemble in order to achieve something which has novel properties and structures. So basically, by combining functional ligands and metals, any metal from the periodic table, you enter different fields. You can control the coordination free of the system and therefore enter reactivity, homogeneous catalysis. It has implication also in a number of other properties, magnetic properties and physical properties. You can anchor molecules on surfaces which reach that the area of surface coordination chemistry and nanomaterials. You can anchor molecules on metal surfaces, and physicists are now becoming very interested in decorating metal surfaces with well-identified molecules characterized well, at the molecular level, anchored through various ligands on metal surfaces. So, of course, 
This is the teamwork over the years. I don't want to go through the detail. Usually I give them the name of the co-workers on the bottom of the slide, but they should reserve, deserve the credit for what has been done over the years. I would like to finish by three quotes. Louis Pasteur, in the field of observation, chance only favors a prepared mind. You have to be lucky. What I'm telling you today was only what was successful. We never talk about what was unsuccessful. Our students have to learn patience. They have to learn how to see the unpredicted, the unexpected. That is a lesson we have to learn from Louis Pasteur. Einstein said if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? <laughs> I very much like the quote. I haven't used it. Uh, for funding agencies, it's tricky. <laughs> they don't like it, but I think this is absolutely true. That's what research is all about. How can you predict the outcome of research? This is ridiculous to ask you a five years plan. I will have discovered this in three years' time. This is absolutely ridiculous. And Churchill said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. This is also a very strong message to the young generation. Go ahead. Please continue. Never get stopped by failure. Everyone has encountered failure before. So never get disappointed. I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your very patient attention, the great hospitality here in Lisbon. Thank you in particular to Armando for the great job. And never forget the periodic table. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Pierre, for such an interesting talk. And now it's our pleasure to introduce Professor, there's also Pierre, but where is Pierre Visneuve is from Rennes, and so from another university, and so with other metals in the periodic table. Oh, you have not yet? You can, you will use your computer, okay. And so, Professor Visneuve, <coughs> well, is a member of the Institut Universitaire de France, he is Vice President for Research of the University of Rennes and Deputy Director of CNRS Chemistry Headquarters in Paris. Yeah. He has a, a high number of publications, over 460, seven books, eight patents, and uh, within the books I can uh, is simplify with metal catalyzed reactions in water and organometallics for green catalysis because really they concern the topic, the topic of uh, the session. Yeah. He has been awarded uh, also a number of distinctions as member of the European Academy of Sciences, of the Portuguese Chemical Science as well, honorary professor of various universities in China and, and Japan and honoris causa, Dr. Honoris Causa from the University of Waterloo in, uh, in Canada. Uh, well, so many things that uh, is difficult to summarize. So the many research topics that he has been involved concern the carbon-rich organometallics and the new molecular architectures, homogeneous catalysis, especially with ruthenium catalysts for alkyne and alkene activation, CH bond activation and functionalization from ruthenium to copper catalysis, yeah. metal catalysis in water and green chemist, as I have already mentioned. And uh, last but not least, we have also been collaborating with them in other initiatives and he is a member of the External Advisory Committee of CATSUS, that is a program on catalysis sustainability that is, well, located at IST, but also with the University of Lisbon and the New University, sorry, the New University of Lisbon and the University of Coimbra as well. So he has been a member, very useful of the International Advisory Committee. So, Pierre, please. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I come from the University of Rennes, where one famous uh, uh, president from your uh, country worked in seven, from 1475 to 14, 1st of May 74, 
Mario Suarez work two days and a half each week there, okay, when he was in exile. And um, so uh, now I'm here at the um, Academy of Science. I want, I'm very pleased to be here. I thank you very much. It's good that the permanent people of the member uh, selected me to come here and invite me here. Um, yesterday, I buried one uh, uh, brother-in-law, and uh, we were together 60 years. And um, when that happened to you, um, you go back in your life. And uh, actually, you will, excuse me, but I want, yesterday I went to my school. Oh, this doesn't work. Okay, so I went back to my village, my school. So I want to, um, I want to dedicate uh, this lecture to my school teacher when I was 11. He was so good for, to encourage me to study, to understand, and also he encouraged my parents to send me to the college. So if I don't meet this man, I will not be here today. And uh, maybe I, I don't have, uh, uh, I am first row. I'm not sure you recognize me, <laughs> okay? And usually I am first row and left. So I am the first on the left. So today I will discuss about, mostly about ruthenium uh, chemistry. Ruthenium was an element which was discovered 175 years ago. And uh, I will discuss this in my introduction. And after, I will discuss some results about, first about ruthenium catalyst. Um, then I will, at the end, discuss very uh, recent work uh, involving um, uh, platinum metals, which are rhodium and palladium. So uh, Klaus, was uh, um, a German guy, but working, living in Russia, who discovered a uh, ruthenium element. It was the last platinum metal to be uh, uh, identified, isolated here. And so he, he, uh, he isolated it in 1844, and uh, actually at the time in um, Russia, the coins were made from platinum. And when they do platinum, it was cheaper than, than gold. And when you extract platinum, you have a lot of ores. So in 1830, uh, the Tsar wanted people to work on this to try to recover more platinum or other metal. So Klaus worked on this. And he find a way to uh, uh, transform the ore into ruthenium dioxide. And after hydrogenation, he uh, produced the element uh, ruthenium. And there was uh, a little battle at that time because another guy, uh, uh, another guy from uh, uh, Russia, uh, find a mixture of elements. He believed it was ruthenium, so he gave the name of ruthenia, which means uh, uh, mother land. But because um, uh, Klaus was German, he called it fatherland. Ruthenia means Russia. So uh, Professor uh, Klaus was professor in uh, Kazan on the uh, Volga River. So you see here the six uh, platinum metal elements and uh, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, platinum. Actually, uh, the ruthenium is the cheapest. And uh, I will talk more about this. Uh, now, you will notice that this um, uh, uh, periodic table is written in Portuguese for you. So, uh, ruthenium was used to build catalysts from the year 1960 about. And uh, this is really in the 90, for the, this decade, that uh, there was a so big increase in the production of new ruthenium complex. At the beginning, ruthenium was used, very simple complex for hydrogenation, for uh, oxidation with ruthenium, uh, 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 
uh, tetraoxide, for instance. But uh, you know, and the, the, the decade where Noyori and Grubbs were working on their reaction, at this time, you know, the number of preparation of different ruthenium complex came. And uh, if you want to see a review, which is very interesting, you can look at the minor impurity uh, spent ores of the Siberian metal, ruthenium turned 175. So this is recent, Chemistry European Journal. And uh, you should know to understand the title that I put in red, that Siberian's metal means platinum. They call it this way because it was a, the element to, uh, to prepare the, the coin. So I will, uh, during my talk, I will discuss mostly ruthenium, but other one reaction with the two, rhodium and um, palladium. And I will show the importance of this catalyst to do green chemistry or sustainable chemistry. Uh, this result come from my group. And uh, the first reaction I want to discuss with you is ruthenium alkylidine catalyst for alkyl metathesis. And here you see the mechanism of alkyl metathesis. Pierre Bronstein has already mentioned this. And uh, no, I have no chance. Yes, yes, it's coming. And um, you know, you rearrange, you cut the double bond here, and you rearrange the other group here. And the mechanism was um, found by uh, uh, Yves Chauvin in 1971 uh, for the principle. It took several years for people, especially American, to accept this mechanism. And uh, Schumann told me that uh, three years later, uh, then some people started to, do, to understand this. And actually, this mechanism is based on metal carbine or alkylidine here. And so people uh, try to, uh, to make very uh, sophisticated complex, like this one with a uh, carbine, ruthenium. This one was made in 1999, but the most, the initial one by Grubbs was 1993. And the one by uh, Schrock was 1990. That's been between 1971 and 1990, you have 19 years. Chemists are too slow. You know, because people didn't believe in the mechanism Chauvin at the beginning. So he didn't try to make complex uh, with, uh, with carbine. And actually they did well because uh, Chauvin for mechanism, Grubbs for his ruthenium complex, and Schrock for molybdenum catalyst here, they got Nobel Prize in uh, 2005, and this picture was taken in Lyon in 2006. So what did we do with this? Here you have the catalyst, which is based on uh, uh, Grubbs catalyst. We call it Oveda uh, Grubbs catalyst, or Grubbs II catalyst. And uh, this is application to modification of terpene. Uh, terpene are obtained from plant, and we can modify using this type of catalyst in a very clean way. That means you take this compound and you take metacrylate. Actually, in the operation, you will clear this bond, you will clear this bond, and you will attach this three carbon here. And the reaction takes place without solvent. The conditions are 90 degrees for eight hours, 10 hours. So you form this, this molecule here, which has the same number of carbon uh, directly. You know, it looks like if you have oxidation. So this is an example of green chemistry. Because uh, if you compare the condition, this is the reaction I discussed with you. You make this product in one step. And the, the stereochemistry is as indicated here you have no solvent, 90 degrees, and uh, 17, uh, 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 I cannot read here. This, was, this example was 15 hours, okay? Previously, you had to oxidize this compound to get aldehyde, and then you oxidize into carboxylic acid and ester. Or this way, you make the carboxylic, and then with diazo, you make this. So actually, in one step, 
very uh, quickly you can make a useful compound which were made before uh, in several steps by oxidation. The second example I want to tell you, it was a discussion with the company Arkema. The company Arkema produced um, polyamide. They produce many things, especially polyamide. And the question was this, can we uh, make uh, amino acid of this linear one, which are the base for, for um, uh, polyamide, can we make this from the cross metathesis between a product coming from castor oil and acrylonitrile, okay? So if we can make this, and after we can hydrogenate, we need to hydrogenate CN group, and then you will get polyamide here. And actually, this is probably the best example of reaction Hayad, which work immediately with a company. And here I put polyamide 11, that means you have 11 carbon in the chain for each monomer, and with the same polyamide, this is the material that uh, Akema is able to do, very resistant one, okay, or very soft one here. So we perform this reaction, and for this, we use the Grops uh, 2 uh, compound, Grops Oveda, so the reaction works at 100 degree, and it works very well, okay, with this catalyst here. And even we can improve the catalytic system when we introduce with a syringe the catalyst progressively. Because when the catalyst, um, Grubbs catalyst is used, it decomposes uh, slightly. But we use this property because after we need to hydrogenate the double bond, it's so easy, but CN is difficult. Usually, Arkema use uh, uh, nickel, uh, um, uh, solid state nickel derivative here. And so what we did, after the reaction is performed, we use the solution was transferred in an autoclave because the solution co co contained ruthenium coming from the decomposition of this catalyst here. And under 20 bars hydrogen of hydrogen, 80 degrees, we can make, we can hydrogenate CN into uh, amine, so we can get the, 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 the monomer leaving to, giving to the um, uh, polyamide. And then, you know, we are interested by this amino acid after hydrogenation of CN. So there was a question, when we do this reaction, the turnover uh, number is 3,000. That's mean one atom of ruthenium produce 3,000 molecules of monomer, okay? And so there was the idea to change. Try, it is very, this is a chema process. You can transfer this molecule coming from plant oil with ammonia, so you make the nitrile here. So look at this, we just exchange the molecule. Instead of CN, we put ester. Instead of uh, carboxylate, we put CN and we do the reaction. And then, you know, the turnover was 17,000. That means the company, you know, didn't hesitate. She selected this process, of course. And at the same time, we in Rennes discover some uh, cat catalyst precursor. So it was made very easily from propagyl alcohol when the carbon usually with a ruthenium system are made from diazoalkane. And of course, the, the, the process which is used in industry doesn't involve the Grubbs catalyst because the company doesn't want to use a catalyst which is too well protected by patents. Now I would like to discuss CH bond uh, functionalization. This is um, uh, a topic we, we started 10 years ago about. And the, the principle uh, connected with green chemistry is this. You know, um, uh, this is cross-coupling reaction, which is catalyzed. You know, you can take a magnesium, a lithium, and zinc derivative tin, and you can couple the two carbon-carbon coming from this organometallic and this halide with nickel zero or palladium catalyst, you can make the cross-coupling reaction here. 
But every time you do this, you need one equivalent of organometallic that you make, for instance, if you want to make a green algae, you, stay, you start from aryl bromide, you use uh, magnesium zero, and you make the green algae, okay? So you need to make halogen, you need to do the green algae, and then you do the coupling. So it will be more sustainable chemistry if we can replace all these reactions. You cannot imagine how many processes are still used in industry with the Suzuki reaction, which is here, because it works very well. It's secure. Uh, a real boronic acid are stable. They can keep in the, in, in the, the fridge, for instance. So that was the, uh, there is a tendency to explore this uh, possibility to um, do the same product as here, but directly from CH bond, we say activation, and uh, to couple with a real light. So our job was to use ruthenium-2 system for this because they are cheaper than palladium rhodium. Uh, they are stable, easy to make. Uh, this is why we do this chemistry, because ruthenium catalysts are easy to make. And uh, also sometimes they are even so stable in water. Okay? So we started this way. And here I just uh, mentioned one or two reactions. I start by mechanism. This is all reaction. This is 10 years ago, I think, uh, about, okay? So this is a reaction. You need a directing group for, uh, uh, for an interaction with the CH bond at auto position here. So we use a ruthenium-2. We use acetate, two equivalent per ruthenium, and uh, the reaction take 120 degree, one half, and before, you need a ligand and you need, um, uh, such as phosphine for instance, and you need 20 hours here. So the catalyst is this one. So we wanted to understand how it works. At the beginning, people believe this is like palladium chemistry, that the first step is oxidative addition of aryl bromide to the ruthenium too. But we know, you know, we know ruthenium, so we knew it was not possible, okay? So we look at the kinetics with Annie Jutin from Paris, okay? And she showed, this is a catalyst precursor, she showed the first product to be formed is a cyclometallate here with the acetate which is here. The ray kinetics is made at 27 degrees in acetonitrile. So I don't use, no longer use activation. It's very easy to deprotonate CH1. Very easy. You deprotonate with acetate coming from outside, okay? And then after the most difficult things to do, when you have uh, the cyclometallated product, is to functionalize this carbon. So after we do by oxidative addition, and then you get reductive elimination, and you will get this. But please note that this reaction works with aryl chloride, with, which are cheap, and uh, when uh, most organometallic species are shown for cross-coupling reaction before with palladium, were from aryl bromide or iodide. The advantage of this uh, mechanism is that it should work in water if the catalyst is stable in water. And just quickly, I tell you, it works. And this lady, uh, she does, she comes from India and she does now a postdoc in Germany. She showed it works much better in water than in organic solvent. And you use pivalate instead of acetate. And the reaction is finished after two hours. And this second number reflect the activity of the catalyst in diether chloride, NMP, water, water is the best. So now I start to give you some example of this. Uh, long time ago, um, 10 years ago, we uh, made this reaction, no problem. It was in organic solvent. So the pyridine shows you it can direct activation of two CH bond here, or functionalization of two CH bond. But the question was why the reaction stop here? Look here, you have a CH bond which is close to a pyridine. Why we couldn't go? And at that time we didn't find solution. The solution is, you know, why we cannot do this molecule, okay? 
because these heterocyclic ligands can be used for a lot of design of new catalysts and even for supramolecular chemistry and photocatalyst. So this soil, that was a postdoc from Marie Curie Grant, and they recently uh, uh, succeeded to, to make it. The trick is that you operate in water. You put a large amount of this, eight equivalent when you need five only, and you may use a phosphine, and we use carbonate, a little carboxylic acid, and you can get this, you know, proportion is 10%, 90%, after chromatography, 80%. Now you can make a variety of ligands. I just give you a few, just a few. You know, here you have four CH bonds to transform, and then we can really, we have a lot of examples where we put heterocycle here. You know, this nitrogen functional help to functionalize CH bond here. So we can make all these molecules here. What is the interest of this molecule? We can make new complex. For instance, look here. This is hexapyridine. We can put one ruthenium here. The ruthenium will fix two consecutive pyridine. We can put another ruthenium here. But what is more important for you, maybe, is that when you do this with palladium chloride or uh, platinum chloride, you can make ruthenium uh, platinum or ruthenium palladium or palladium palladium um, uh, rhodium rhodium here. So now uh, this can be applied very easily. The second reaction I want to show is uh, functionalization of phosphine. You know, um, most uh, catalysts um, use inhomogeneous um, uh, chemistry. Uh, the, their activity is revealed by at least one phosphine. No, not, not every, not every one, but a l big number. So the question is, um, and if you take two different phosphines, the activity of the catalyst will be very different. So the, the question is now, can we modify phosphine more easily? And uh, this is, we try this, but when you have uh, the phosphine, if you coordinate the metal here, its interaction with CH bond will form a four-member cycle, so it's not possible to do. So the trick is to oxidize the phosphine. You made phosphine oxide, and the PO is a, is a directing group, and we can make some functionalization. And I want to show you this one. So this is the principle here. You can get this intermediate. You could get this intermediate, but as you form a four-member, it's not possible. With phosphine oxide, you get this intermediate here, and then by functionalization, you can introduce functional group at this position here. So the reaction worked this way. The first time we did the reaction, not we do, in acetic acid. But also, we use copper too, because uh, everybody, organic people, organic synthesis people, they put very often copper too because they believe at the end you have a palladium zero or you have ruthenium zero, so you need to reoxidize. And look here, I say the first one with missile, 53%. Now I don't put copper. 58, so it's the same. That means you don't need copper two, okay? You don't need copper two. Even sometimes people put reagent, you don't need. And uh, so you can do many functionalization. This is alkylation, alkylation. And even with alkyne, you make a vinyl group, and the reaction was uh, regioselective here. And uh, you can see uh, this is not atom uh, Michael type reaction. And uh, of course, after you can, uh, uh, you can transform carboxylic acid, no, car ester into carboxylic acid. And it is known that it's very easy to uh, reduce phosphine oxide with silane into phosphine. Okay? What is the um, mechanism of the reaction? I don't want to go in detail with you, but what is important is you need to do the reaction. If you want alkylation, you need to operate in carboxylic acid because for Pierre Bronstein will, uh, will believe me very easily, when you have this intermediate, you know, this cycle is rigid. You cannot get beta elimination. 
Even if you look at uh, organic letters, they will say this is beta elimination. This is not true. To get beta elimination, you need that the ruthenium carbon, carbon alpha, carbon beta, carbon beta hydrogen should be coplanar and thin. Okay? Actually, the acid cleave the ruthenium carbon. I don't want to go into detail for this. Okay? So this is, um, with this, this ligand which are optically active, I want you to show the potential of this reaction. The optically active ligands are very expensive. They are carol, of course. Eh? So now, if you make the oxide, you have the possibility to introduce at the right position, maybe here or here, you can introduce a real group or alkyl group or alkenyl group here easily. And actually, we wrote a paper on, um, um, on a review on the, uh, the function on, on phosphine, you know, um, late stage modification of phosphine derivative. And so we uh, choose this, not me, but my colleague Jean Francois Soulet, he put this for the cover of Chemcom because the, pip, the, 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 the review was written by us in March when uh, cherry tree flowers. Okay? And then they, it came into a Chemcom in um, June when the fruit come, cherries. But to go from the flower to the cherries, you need some catalyst. To go from the flower here, yeah, there are the bees. So this is a catalyst. So last uh, reaction, a uh, couple of reaction. I want to show the last, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I think, important reaction we did, which was published in Angevante Chemie in, uh, in July. And this involved, sorry, involved both a rhodium and palladium catalyst. Um, when you want to make carboxylate, the most traditional method is to take, say, a real group, okay, or heterocycle, and you uh, make a selective bromination. This is the most difficult. But after, you put magnesium, the green yard, okay, and then you can insert CO2, and you will get this intermediate, and then you have the carboxylate, okay? Now there is another possibility. This with the same aryl bromide or heterocyclic bromide, it is known that with palladium zero, you get this intermediate. You can insert CO2. We, this is not isolated, of course, but the product coming are this one and this one. And at this time, the highest yield in this is 52%, uh, okay? And you get this product back because when you have the carboxylate and you remove one electron, you have decarboxylation, okay? So what I want to tell you today is that now we can solve the problem by taking your phosphine and functionalize the phosphine at this position here. So this was done by these two guys. Uh, Jean-François Soulet is a, a CNRS associate professor. So he used this time the phosphine, and when you have this phosphine, you don't activate CH bond here, you activate CH bond here. So you get this intermediate, you can get metallocycle here at this position, orthoprim. You can get arylation, this was known. And what we did, we did alkylation from alkene because we learn with phosphine oxide, okay? So this is the, how the reaction work. You take rhodium because, of course, we have tried ruthenium-2 for this system, but ruthenium-2 doesn't work with phosphine because ruthenium-2 coordinate to phosphine and the bond is strong. You can get activation of CH bond, but it will not be catalytic. But rhodium-1 can do it. You know, it can coordinate to the phosphine, and the bond is not so strong. So you can co decoordinate when the reaction is done. So you take ruthenium, this rhodium uh, one, you operate with one equivalent of, of uh, p-valic acid. This is because we want alkylation. We don't want alkenylation, okay? So we can do all this, okay? I go quick, not this one. Look, it is possible 
to introduce by acrylate of long chain here, we can introduce a group which is long chain. We can introduce a group if the alcohol giving the ester is optically active, you can do this molecule here. Oh, we don't discuss mechanism. Huh? Believe me, it works well. Okay? And also you can do homo dealkylation. That means you introduce two blue groups here, here, and here. And you can do hetero dealkylation. That means you do the first reaction with uh, the blue alkene. Okay? So you will get this group here. And then you add this second alkene and uh, you continue 24 hours and you get this. So we can get this, we can get this one, this one. I like this one very much for the next slide because it has a long chain here and a polar uh, group at this position here. So I come back to the reaction I told you at the beginning. That was a reaction with palladium. When you have aryl bromide with a palladium, you can get carboxylic acid plus decarboxylation product, okay? This is a known reaction. It was made recently by uh, Ruben Martin and uh, um, Iwazawa. Of course, we are in contact with them because we know, the, we know the problem. And with their phosphine they use, you know phosphine, they put isopropyl here, okay? And in that case, they had a very good conversion, but only 52% of carboxylic acid. When we introduce on the same um, system a phosphine on the palladium, you know this one, you go nice, uh, improve uh, yield, and 80% of carboxylic acid. And if you put the long chain, 100% conversion, and 95% of synthesis, okay? But here there is a trick I didn't tell you yet. When you want to be efficient, you need to bring electron, okay? Because if you have a carboxylate, it is stable. If you remove one electron, it decarboxylates. So the trick is this. This can bring electron. We put, in addition, we put an amine, okay? And we put a photocatalyst. So the photocatalyst, when you excite this photocatalyst, the electron goes on the ligand, but the phosphine can give an electron to the vacant lowest orbital here, so you have a very reducing system here. So now we have used this system with palladium, you know, or many aryl bromide. We use this photocatalyst uh, here. We use the palladium here. We use this, and look here. This is uh, the, the best ligand we have ever found. We don't put surfactant, it works only with this long chain. We can do this carboxylation here, okay? So, uh, yeah, uh, some time ago, not long time ago, I, I, I hear somebody from Strasbourg. He also inserts CO2 into carbon uh, metal system. So maybe if you add electron or photocatalyst, maybe you do better, okay? This is a mechanism. You know, I told you this already. You insert CO2 into palladium aryl group, and then when I didn't tell you, we have to put electron here, you have to put electron here. So the electron comes from this. This is a photocatalyst. So you excite with light, okay, visible light. So this is excited. Then the amine give one electron, and this species is very reducing reagent. So I come to the end of my talk when I show you uh, several examples of uh, ruthenium alkylidin catalyst and uh, ruthenium catalyst to make hexa heterocyclic benzene, but we have a lot of ligand now. And also I finish by the rhodium and palladium catalyst, and I didn't want today to discuss, uh, uh, it would be too long here. So the chemistry we are doing, I believe, that we have the potential to modify many optically active phosphine directly, and also to make new catalysts, because when you have a bipyridine ruthenium system, you have still free pyridine, so we can protonate the pyridine, and the catalyst can become soluble in water. 
And the, the last aspect is the, um, the, mod the creation of new photocatalyst. Okay, so this is uh, the organization who gave us some money. I can see Tubitac. We discussed Tubitac at lunchtime with Turkey. And uh, this is Brittany. We had Aina. And also now we have a LIA between uh, Bella and uh, Bruno. This is CNRS, uh, 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 LIA International Laboratory between uh, CNRS France and Labnitz Institute in, uh, in um, Germany, Rostock. So the closest student to me are this one. Uh, all these people have contributed here. And uh, we are far professor in catalysis. My group now is very small. I have one more student, okay? But I am emeritus professor, huh? okay? And, uh, but this year I have only one. But we have seminar every week, and we take a picture together every year. And we have a lot of people here because if I take a, a, a picture of my group, it's too small. So all the group in France are small. So we took picture, the five professors together, so we look bigger, okay? <laughs> but here, this photo was taken when uh, Ben Feringa visited us. So this is um, a look for Christian Bruno. Fishmaster now is doing alkene metathesis. Henri Doucet is very productive in the field of CH bond and palladium chemistry. Heterocyclic is a more organic uh, chemist from our group. Jean-François Soulet, I showed some part of his work here, and I look for Christophe Darcel. He does um, uh, first row uh, metal catalyst system. So um, this is a book we produced this year, last February. I go fast. I want to show you where I take my visitor from Rennes. This is one hour by car to Saint-Malo. This is a city on the... Um, on the water, which is protected by the big wall, because on the north here are the British. So um, <laughs> 10 century ago, there was a lot. We have a war of 107 years. So that was the reason. And the most famous is um, Mont Saint-Michel. That was in, uh, in, in uh, March 2015, when the, 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 the water was above the, the bridge, which is here. This is a monastery, and I finish by, because I come from the Loire Valley, so I want to show you that here we have also a nice castle. You see, no protection. You know, the Mont Saint-Michel, you have protection, you see? Because you know on the north, huh? okay? <laughs> but here, no protection. This is open, this is Renaissance. The king of France lived there. This is a King Henry II, Francois I, okay? And I finish by this one, which is the house of Leonardo da Vinci in Amboise. And uh, usually we take some visitors coming for today's year. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Pierre, for such a, an interesting lecture here. And so, we have no speakers from England today, and so you, you are safe now, and so you can sit on no, the same no, place. <laughs> okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Luis Oro. Uh, yes, he's here. I've been looking for him during all the afternoon. He's in the but, back, uh, yeah. Yes, he's in the back, yeah. And so he's from the University of Zaragoza in Spain, and he is the head and founder of the Homogeneous Catalyst Institute that uh, operates there. His main research concerns organometallic chemistry and homogeneous catalysis of platinum group metals. And uh, he has authored of a high number of papers, over 650, and co authored a book on homogeneous hydrogenation, yeah, and was co editor of a number of other books. He has been invited speakers in many conferences and has been awarded many distinctions as well. Uh, for instance, the Catalan Svatia Prize, the Aragon Prize, and Honoris Causa also from various universities, Rennes, for instance, and Rovira, and Complutense of Madrid, and UKMS Award that he also got, and Lord Louis Prize from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Yeah. 
He has been uh, president of the European Chemical Societies, the UCMS, as chemists know, yeah. And uh, at a certain stage of his life, he had high-level positions in Sp Spanish public administration as well, and was pre vice, has been vice president of the European Science Foundation, yeah. He has also collaborated with, with us by integrating the external advisory committee also of Katsu's PhD program. And so, so thank you, please. <clears throat> well, thank you, thank you very much, Pro, uh, Professor Pombeiro, for your kind introduction. It's for me a great pleasure to be in this uh, academy. I'm very grateful to the academy uh, for, to be nominated corresponding member. So I will try to speak about some mechanistic aspect dealing with rhodium and iridium, and iridium catalyst. But b before that, let me comment that ca I came from Sarag Saragossa, Saragossa University. Something. Oh. I came from Saragossa University. That is, well, probably you know, in the northeast part of Spain, here is the big cathedral in the Ebro River. Our university was founded in 1542. And here is the ceremonial, uh, uh, the ceremonial place of the, uni of the university. So, uh, Saragossa University is particularly interested in scientific asp aspect, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to have the possibility to speak in this important year of Mendeleev. Well, I, I, I have been changing my, my talk because I saw that Peter, uh, Pierre, Pierre Brownstein has introduced Mendeleev, and well, but I have still here the, the same, the, the first, the first, the, this famous that the, you you can you can see here that is written that is 18 of February of uh, of 1869, and uh, well, I think Mendeleev was important, particularly not for ordering and to associate properties with mass but also to be able to predict the existence of the scandium, well, he called a, a aluminium, gallium, and germanium. And he was lucky enough that all this element was discovered when he was still alive. It was gallium, I think it was in 1875. The name gallium, it means, it's clear that this has French origin, scandium, four years later, and uh, germanium in the uh, 885. Okay, so the, uh, at that moment, the number of elements was limited to 63. Many things have changed since then. And you have here now the complete periodic table with 118 uh, element, elements. From, there, from these elements, we are mo uh, mostly using 90 elements. And I think it's, uh, I, I like to, to see this periodic table that has been produced by UCAMS. That is a table that uh, indicate that all the 90 natural elements that we are using, some of them we should be very careful ab about. And you have here in green all the elements that there is no any, any problem, but you will uh, see here in, in other color, in particularly in red, that we will have serious threat and other that we have limited ab ability. ability. And you see here that in this table they have included the telephone numbers. So we are using a lot of elements, a lot of lanthanides that are relatively small quantities and, all, and many of them are controlled by some countries. And part of the tensions that appear now in the market is connected to them. Some of them, uh, for example, thallium. Thallium is the famous coltan, uh, coltan mineral that this creates a lot of problems in, in some countries in, in, in Africa. So we should be very careful about, the, about the, the number of elements that we are using. You, see, you can see here helium. Helium is a real problem. We are using, if we don't recover helium, helium will disappear. And how we can maintain our present technology? Well, for uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, we are using helium, and for many, uh, we are speaking about superconducting. But we should have helium, and helium is disappearing. And so we should be very careful about what happens with the future and what we, uh, they use. 
So some of these elements we should recover. And this is something that people that we are working on uh, platinum metals, we know quite well. So the price is so expensive. It's not just by an environmental question. It's just because we cannot maintain the, uh, the laboratory to, to use uh, 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 big quantities of some of elements. And in this sense, rhodium, iridium, for example, that is the, uh, an area in which we are working now in ind for industrial application, they are ma mainly recovered. So we need to be uh, careful about the use of metals because some of them in, that we need uh, at that moment it will be difficult to find in the, in the, in the future. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I have changed a little bit my talk after, uh, after your presentation, so I will enter directly in, in chemistry. And I will speak about uh, what we are uh, trying to study in our group. We are particularly interest, interested in mechanistic studies to try to understand uh, uh, the reactions. And I, today I will concentrate on rhodium and iridium complexes as catalysts using this carbon, uh, this carbon ligands. So you have here a, a direct carbon-rhodium bond, here the, nitro, the nitrogens, and because these uh, heterocyclic, uh, 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 heterocyclic carbons are excellent ligands and can provide uh, adequate aesthetic uh, protection at the vicinity of the metallic center in some way that we can control a, a selective reaction. Uh, homogeneous catalysis uh, is in testing in many applications because we can control the selectivity. And this is one of the, of the reasons of the, the use of homogeneous catalysis is increasing. Well, so when we are trying to do some reactions, so we have substrates, we, pre we prepare products, and we use the catalyst, and this is the black boss. But what is the question for us in our group is just to understand what is in this black boss, to have a look carefully, and for that we try to isolate or to detect intermediates, to, well, we used to do kinetic measurements, low temperature experiments can be very useful, deuterium label, labeling, or theoretical uh, calculation. So this is the way that we approach in order to see that the catalyst that is provided another route for the reaction, we, we should be happy if we are able to understand what are the intermediates and even to calculate the transition state. If you understand, you understand a, 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 a mechanism, you could try to improve it. And this is what our main aim. So I will... Uh, concentrate on this type of approach in a particular example that is dealing with hydrogen deuterium exchange. So, uh, well, this is the type of carbons that we are using in our laboratory. We start from this dimer and we prepare cationic, neutron, that we are using for different reactions. But I will concentrate on this particular one that uh, provide is a very selective for hydrogen deuterium exchange. Well, this hydrogen deuterium exchange is an interesting reaction. Though the synthesis of deuterated organic compounds is interesting. If you look at any, if you look in a, in a book, a commercial book, the price of deuterated organic samples is normally very, very, exp very expensive because they, they can find, you can find many applications for the study of, of uh, reaction mechanisms, for in vivo monitoring, for simple analysis. And the, the synthesis of this compound, you can use, well, heterogeneous catalysis or different approach or acid uh, catalysis, but the homogeneous catalysis, we can provide very selective reactions. But when we speak about homogeneous catalysis, uh, there are two main mechanisms. So this carbon, carbon hydrogen activation pathway that usually is unable to distinguish between aromatic protons and vinylic protons. However, when the reaction are, uh, are using this insertion elimination pathway, you can have deuteration in a very selective, selective way. And I will show you here a couple of samples. In the right, you have, this is uh, estirin, and you see that only the vinylic protons are deuterated. In this case, uh, using this iridium carbon complex, all the, the, all the hydrogen aromatic 
and vinylic are, uh, are exchanged by, du by deuterium. Well, our catalyst that we study is even more selective. It's only able to deuterate at the beta proton of the vinylic position. So this is uh, the catalyst that we are studying in, in, the, in detail. Well, the synthesis of this catalyst is simple. We start from this dimer. We, are, we, are, we react with 8 uh, quinol, and this is an oxidative addition reaction, and here is the, the compound. So in this position, we'll enter the, uh, the, uh, the olefin, and will be the position in which the reaction takes place. Well, let me show here the use of this catalyst for this reaction. You can observe that only deuterium, in very, in very simple conditions, so we exchange only the, the beta proton of the vinylic. You have here, there is a small amount of the alpha. So it means that it's a selective reaction. Well, you can say, well, it's a good catalyst and very selective, but uh, as I mentioned before, what we try is to understand the mechanism. And to try to understand the mechanism implies to uh, study the reaction. And here is our approach. First, uh, first uh, reaction that we made, just let's try to add estirine to the, uh, to the catalyst at low temperature. And you can observe here that there is a 2-1 insertion. So this is a Markovnikov insertion. If, the, if you add at uh, room temperature, you have here a 1-2 insertion. And this reaction is reversible. So if you go, if you uh, add, if the temperature down, you go to, to the left. What it means? So it means that we have here in blue the, the kinetic isomer, and in red we have the, uh, the therm thermodynamic one. And in fact, this uh, some simple DFT calculation show that. So you see here the transition state that at a low temperature we can distinguish between the thermodynamic and the kinetic, and you can, uh, you can ob observe that. And so this is the reason of the selectivity. Well, so the mechanism of the reaction should imply, first, we start, this is our catalyst. We use deuterated methanol. We exchange hydrogen by deuterium. And now we have the insertion reaction. Uh, this insertion reaction could be Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. Anti but only this one, the 2-1 insertion, is is the reaction that we observe. We don't observe, in this case, the, uh, the, the formation of this product. So it, what it means that there is some problem in this case. And this problem is associated to the C1, C2 rotation, because we are incorporating the deuterium, but not for the elimination. We need a rotation. But here we have some aesthetic problem. If the final group is here, can has a conflict with this substituent, and there is no re any reaction. So we cannot observe the formation of this compound, and what we get, in this case, no problem. The rotation is allowed, and it's possible to observe. This is the reason of the selectivity, and again, by DFT calculations, provide information. So the rotation uh, of the methyl group, you have here the methyl group, is a simple one. Here is hydrogen deuterium is exchanging. In the case of the uh, of, of this uh, of the one two insertion, so this this uh, final group has conflict, and so there is no there is no way to to find the uh, the uh, the transition state. So this is the reason of the selectivity, and uh, here we have the co the complete picture. So the the kinetic isomer is here. This is the thermodynamic one. So, but even at room temperature, although this is for this is formed, there is no way to exchange hydrogen deuterium by rotation, and this is the reason because we have the, sele the selectivity. Okay, so it's clear that this aesthetic problem. So we said, okay, why why instead of using carbon, we use other uh, conventional ligands that in to see if it is possible to do to do the reaction with high selectivity. And we move to cyclooxyl phosphine. Cyclooxyl phosphine is also a very basic phosphine, has a large uh, 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 cone angle. And so we thought 
maybe would be possible and we prepare exactly the same compound but instead of the carbon we, we prepare with the cyclooxate phosphine. We made the reaction and the reaction it works but you see that the selectivity is lower. So this is slow and you see that here we have a, a alpha formation is about 22%. And in our case with this catalyst <coughs> the reaction is very selective it practically there is no for formation. What is the reason of that? It's just the orientation of the aesthetic uh, difficulties. In the case of the, of the carbon, so you see here that these uh, substituents are just in the, like, like, like an umbrella. So they are close the, towards the equatorial plane of the catalyst. In the case of the cyclosyl phosphine, so this is the, the cone is out of the, of the metal center, and so this steric effect is out, and this explains why one compound uh, is, is selective, and in this case, there is no selectivity. So, okay, so this is a good catalyst we have used for uh, several, uh, in several cases. Well, here is a table I will not enter in detail. That's to mention that well, just increasing the, the temperature, we can, the reaction is faster. Uh, I think it's interesting to mention that also in deuterated water uh, can, can work. So we can make a, a, a also a hydrogen deuterium exchange in deuterated water. And it's not only applied to aromatic olefins, also alkylic olefins, also the selectivity is relatively high. Here, well, we, as I mentioned, we are using several carbon complexes. Here is a, a, a collection of carbon complexes, and you see that sometimes this is this the, the number 11, that is the cationic, the cationic one, is very fast. It's very fast, but the selectivity is poor, poor. So the best catalyst for application is number six, this one, in which, in this case, the selectivity is uh, over 96, uh, 96%. Well, with this information, what we are convinced that we can deuterate uh, uh, ole uh, aromatic olefins in uh, some way uh, very selective. So our catalyst is able to uh, deuterate only at the beta position. This catalyst prepared by Milstein some years ago deuterate at all the, uh, the uh, protons, vinylic protons, but uh, you don't need to, to, to prepare this catalyst. I said to my student, well, try to prepare the, the Milstein catalyst, and he made a simple experiment. He took this dimuchlorotetrachycycloctin dirrhodium, he had some acid, and immediately <coughs> the result is the same. So here you have the, the data. So there's <coughs> uh, you don't need to make to prepare this sophisticated one. Just in situ, you have the hydrogenation, the relatively fast of the all the vinylic protons. So with this information, what we can do is just to make to make deuteration a la carte that I call. So with our catalyst, we introduce the deuterium at the beta position. If we use this uh, catalyst, carbon iridium catalyst, we can deuterate it all the positions. But here, with this catalyst, here we are using deuterated methanol. Here we are using methanol. What happens now? That we are exchanging just the beta protons, hydrogen, hydrogen, and deuterium is in the alpha position. Okay, so if we use this in situ catalyst, we deuterate here. And now, if we use our catalyst in methanol, now you have here the hydrogens, uh, a hydrogen here in the deuterium. So this compound and this compound is exactly the same. The difference is that the, in this case, the deuterium are in, uh, the aromatic uh, protons are deuterated. In this case, are not, uh, not uh, deuterated. So, okay, so we can make with this type of uh, systems some kind of uh, a la, a la carte de, de deuteration. Well, I <coughs> mentioned on the title that I will speak about not only rhodium and iridium, uh, and sun iridium systems. So we are also using sun iridium heterocyclic carbon catalyst, and uh, my colleague has introduced the, 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 
the discovery of sun elements, but I should like to comment about the Iridium discovery. And it was celebrated in a very typical UK behavior, but organized, uh, just preparing a an special, an special beer. So Tennant, in, in 1803, discovered uh, Iridium. Tennant was the discoverer of uh, Iridium and Osmium, and I think one year later, also in UK, was discovered Rhodium. So I was invited a few years ago the, to the celebrate at York University the, tenam, uh, uh, the, ten, the 250th anniversary of the Tenant, and they produced this beer. I can say that it was an excellent beer. That's a, but okay, so it's a good, a good celebration. Okay, so, uh, well, what is the reaction that we uh, have been studying with this iridium catalyst? Well, we have been in several reactions, but hydrosililation is one of, of the reaction of our interest. And uh, we become interested in this reaction from, from alkynes and so because vinyl silanes are important building blocks in organic chemistry. Uh, but particularly, the more stable one is this one, but it's not the more useful. The more useful is the beta cis vinyl silane, and it's not easy to prepare. So we decided, well, let's try to find a catalyst that can provide the selective, at least in high yield, synthesis of this compound. And this, our approach, it was to use biscarbing compounds. So the idea was, let's prepare biscarbing compounds with emilabile uh, uh, arms that this oxygen can open. And the idea was that this, this open, this oxygen open for coordination, now the, we have some kind of static uh, problems that we will favor the formation of the beta uh, cis vinyl silanes instead of the more thermodynamic one. Well, it was an idea, maybe a crazy idea, but fortunately it works. It works, and well, here is the synthesis. We start from here, we prepare the acetate, we protonate, and here is the compound. Well, we prepare the rhodium, the iridium. The best one is the iridium. And, well, the idea is, is, is simply that these oxygen arms will uh, open, the catalyst enter, and we will create the conditions for the, for, for the formation of the, uh, the cis ceiling. Okay, so here we have, well, several alkynes. You see here the selectivity. So, in the, some cases we have, well, 86, 94, well, it depends, 98 in some cases. So we find that this is a selective, selective reaction. But as I mentioned to you, our interest is not just to, to have a high yield, that is important, of course, for, a, for application, but to understand the, me the mechanism. I think, uh, particularly in the academic world, something that we can do is just to train our students to prepare to the future. And to prepare the future is not to make the table with more high yields or, 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 or no, to understand the mechanism. If they understand the mechanism, they can uh, offer possibilities and they can to improve the, the reaction. So, okay, so we enter there and at the very beginning in the, in the blackboard you can write anything. So the proposal was this one. So this is the typical reaction. You will have the uh, oxidative, uh, oxidative addition, it will enter the alkyne, will be the insertion and the beta elimination. So this is the typical reaction. So we pass this problem with this scheme to our colleague that is working on DFT and he said, well, I have doubts about that because this uh, oxidative addition, the barrier is very high and it's not compatible. So, meanwhile, I said to the student, try to use not only acetone, and acetone was working very well. Try with other solvents just to, to well, uh, this typical exploration, uh, less to improve the system. And the answer was that no solvent and no solvent was a possible to make the reaction. So, only acetone, it, it was working. What it means? That something, acetone, play a role. This, this is clear. So, okay. So, we... We look at that and say, well, why not to have the possibility that the, the reaction imply 
the coordination of the silane instead of the oxidative addition, because our DFT MEM set oxidative addition is very high the barrier. And this the sigma coordination has been found in several cases. And now the, there is an interaction with the with the uh, acetone and the formation of a siloxy carbonium ion. Well, uh, so this this reaction is is not just that we, you, we, have, we have taken some beer and we decided to propose something exotic. No, the, there are some precedents. So, Bruchar, uh, in, I found in 2010, uh, found the, this, this system in which he isolated this sigma cord, this monoapto coordination of the silane, and he uh, uh, provided valuable information about the system of the siloxy carbonium ion. So we said, okay, muy probably we are just in the same situation. So our uh, DFT man was happy with that. Okay, this uh, he likes. So this is the coordination. Now the ketone is the responsible of the heterolytic split, splitting of the silane and now the siloxy uh, carbonium, uh, carbonium ion is, is, is formed. So this justifies this part of the reaction. The next step will be the reaction of the siloxy carbonium with the alkyne, and this is also feasible. And the final step will be the vinyl silane form for formation that uh, uh, provides the different the energy between the two possibilities, provide clear information about the, form the formation of the, of the compound that we have observed. What it means this reaction? Well, this, this is the first case of outer sphere ionic hydroxylation catalysis. catalysis. So I have been teaching uh, homogeneous catalysis in Zaragoza, I think 25 years or something like that. During many years, I explained to the, to the students, well, we need the metal, we need the coordination of the metal, and now, well, you activate and the reaction happens. What we know since Noyori in, the, in recent years, that it's possible to do the, the reactions by, uh, without coordination to the metal. This is the Noyori case of ruthenium, and this is an example of ionic uh, hydrogenation, and there are some examples by Bullock on, on tungsten, or on, uh, Nikonov in ruthenium, or, ja or Jack Norton. So what it means that we have here first uh, 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 the splitting and we have an H plus an H minus minus reaction that explain the, uh, the the behavior. So we should be prepared to change our mind. So I, I was 20 years telling something that it was incorrect. Now in the recent years I told I told the truth. So it's possible also to have a mechanism in which there is no coordination in this out the sphere, and we have just this uh, that could be sequential, as in this case, or we uh, simultaneous, uh, as in the noyori no compounds. Well, this is the presentation that I want to to, to share with you, and just to to mention that the understanding of the mechanism of, uh, of catalysis is an important tool, in, but in addition, not only an important tool, I think it's a good training that we can provide to our students. Uh, we cannot compete with the industry. Industry will know quite well how to prepare a product in, in high yield and with the minimum cost. But we can do is just to try to understand some reactions that they are doing, and sometimes they don't still know in detail how is the mechanism. Just to finish, let, let me thank to, to my co-workers. Well, you know Ricardo Castarlena made a, a, a postdoc with, with Pierre uh, Brownstein, uh, sorry, with Pierre Disneff. Now he's, a, now he's a, in, a, in a permanent position and you see that he's serious. When he was with, uh, with uh, Pierre Disneff, he was, la, well, uh, he, Pierre, Pierre called him the homus Pyrenaicus, no? You remember? <laughs> well, it came from the Pyrenees, from a small village on the Pyrenees. Uh, so, Andrea Di, Andrea Di Giuseppe is a postdoc, that uh, Italian postdoc, very, very good. That now is in Edinburgh, and Laura Palacio that made a thesis on, the, on, the, on this area, and Victor Polo doing the, uh, the DFT calculation, and Fernando Laoz, the uh, X-ray crystallography. Well, here is Zaragoza. You see, 
no, not far between Madrid and Barcelona, not far from the French border. We have still mountains and skiing in, in, in winter. And Zaragoza was founded by Romans more, more than 2,000 years ago. So the name, the Zaragoza was, uh, the, the original name was Cesar Augusta, but the Cesar Augusta was changing. When the Arabs arrived there, they called Saracosta. Well, now it's Zaragoza. So this is the, so this, the Roman wall is still there. Uh, this is an actual view. And well, here is also from the Roman period, and here is from the Arabs the period. So this is still uh, well preserved, and now the regional government of, his, uh, of Zaragoza of Aragon is, he, is here. And here is some views. So this is the cathedral, this is the Palace of Justice, this is the ceremonial room of the university, and some uh, nice, nice building from, uh, from some centuries ago. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the Academia uh, for uh, inviting us and for honoring us uh, as corresponding members. Thank you very much. Just introduce a very, very short introduction now um, for our new members, new correspondent members. There is a tradition here that you will be formally enter the uh, academia when you make your first presentation. So that is why I should have here the diploma of your presentation. We make sure that I. I provide, I give you the, the right one, not the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. So you're now officially a member of our academy. Thank you very much. Thank today. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for coming Thank here. <laughs> Which is now the best picture taken after you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. For it was an honor for us. Okay, well, I think it's my turn, and uh, oh, that's a, a good, a good projection there. <laughs> and so I think I have the privilege of not requiring presentation, and so I'm not going to present myself. And apart from that, also in the end, at the end, I do not need to present Lisbon. And so I think I can concentrate more on science, and so there, there are advantages of playing at home. Yeah. Well, this is the title of, uh, of my talk, also in the field of catalysis, to agree with this session. And you can see it concerns the potential application of alkanes in organic synthesis. And you can see there are a number of keywords there. One is alkane, another one is, well, functionalization, periodic table, and catalysts. And so, Yeah, why alkanes? So why the interest on uh, alkanes and its functionalization? So I, I invite you to look first at this picture taken by NASA, uh, by NASA at night, and where you can see that uh, oil field, oil shale field in Bakken, and then other, other cities. The, the top ones are already in Canada, and the others are still in the United States. And this is the light emitted by flaring 
natural gas, mainly methane, yeah, because it is not used. And so the, the oil field is interested in oil and liquid and not in gas. And so it's cheaper to burn than to uh, use it. And so you can see the waste and the resulting pollution that is also uh, happening there. That area that you see illuminated at night corresponding to Bakken is as large as Wales, as the Wales. Yeah. And it, was, it is estimated that the energy that is lost, totally lost by this flaring, would be sufficient to power, uh, uh, well, uh, Minneapolis that is there and uh, Washington as well. So you can see what we are losing. Now we are at the same time losing carbon and from Earth going to the atmosphere and we are losing non, uh, uh, well, non-renewable fossil fuels. So the question arises, well, can this uh, change? Can the application of volcanoes that are currently simply lost or burnt in our house or so or in our uh, cars that we want to take energy from there, but in any case leading to CO2 with environmental problems as well. So the question is, can this application shift to another much noble one, that is to use them as feedstocks for organic synthesis of functionalized products. So for that, of course, you need, you need to functionalize the alkanes, that is to convert them into other species like alcohols, carboxylic acids or so. And you can see the reaction on the right. Well, it's an artistic view of the alkane functionalization where on the right you have you have the, the pointer? You have the pointer? Pointer? <laughs> I, I think it is with Zemanel, yeah. Try, try to put it my, my, my stuff oh, in. Don't worry, yeah, this is ah, working. Okay, this okay. Is, thanks a lot, Pierre. Well, I Anyway. Yeah, okay. So, this is what I represent here as functionalization of alkanes. You have the alkane and then it becomes decorated with some beautiful blossoms, and this reminds me a uh, blooming almond tree branch at the Algarve. And so you see here in winter, but then it becomes, well, with those beautiful blossoms in spring. And so it's like the alkane functionalization that we are, we are doing. Alkanes are very inert, and so for that we need a catalyst. And very often a catalyst, as you have seen in the previous talks, is composed of a metal and various ligands. And so here it is useful if we look at the periodic table, of course. And so we are in the topic of this session. You, of course, I have to say something about Mendeleev here. He was very much connected to St. Petersburg University. And I can show you what was until recently the largest periodic table in the world. Nowadays, with the celebrations, well, they are uh, other possibilities, but for many, many years, many decades, this was the largest one you can see on the wall of this, of this building. And another thing that con is concerns uh, Mendeleev that not many people know, in fact very few, is that when he was a student, so not like this, but much younger, in fact he, uh, the PhD, his PhD thesis was about vodka. Very applied, very applied, and he was studying composition of vodka and the corresponding properties. And he found that 40% alcohol is the ideal percentage of alcohol. And if you look at every vodka bottle, you will see there 40% alcohol. And so that's a magic number. And it was justified in the thesis of Mendeleev. And so really was a man of uh, many resources. Yeah. That probably was the inspiration for the idea of creating the periodic table here. Yeah. Anyhow, here we have a version of periodic table as presented by UPAC. And uh, I looked at it and started to think what our group, uh, that's Coordination Chemistry and Catalysis Group at IST, is being doing in catalysis for alkane functionalization. Which elements have we been applying? And in fact, if you look at this, the, in red are those ones, are metals that are that form active catalysts. And so they, they have an active role in the catalytic process. So they are indicated by red. They are framed by red. Others are not, do not have a direct catalytic effect, but they have an electronic or structural 
uh, effect, important also in some cases, and they are, well, this is no longer working, but they are on the left, and so the, in the indicated in blue. And others on the right, you can see on further right, periodic tables are non-metals, yeah, and they are framed in, in, in brown. And so they are uh, applied mainly in the composition of ligands. And so I, I was very happy to see this because, in fact, our group in this field has already uh, shown interest along all the groups of periodic table except that one, group four, and the last one of the novel gases, that is iner inert gas, of course, that so far is not useful in this field. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, I cannot show you, but you can see here that the transition metals that are, well, uh, close to active catalytic role there, that, that word there, you can see that they are first row. They are most abundant and cheap. Uh, transition metals. And so we have trying to develop uh, activation, of, uh, well, functionalization of volcanoes using the, these uh, cheap metals and with low environmental impact. Okay, so that's. So far we have seen examples by other colleagues yeah, who talked about heavier metals, so not so cheap, and so, but they can be more active for various types of reactions. Yeah. The field has been uh, uh, reviewed recently on this book that we have edited and just came out this year by uh, John Weiler editors. Yeah, on the title is Alkane Functionalization. Oh, this also works. So here, here will be easy. So the, if we want sustainable systems, sustainable catalytic systems for this, of course, use of water would be very convenient. Yeah. But it is also challenging in this field because the substrates, our alkanes are not soluble in water. And usually catalysts also are not soluble. But if we use suitable uh, ligands uh, that are soluble in water, indicated by L, then by coordinate to the metal, if we are lucky, we can get a catalyst, a transition metal catalyst or so, that is uh, hydrosoluble. And then we can develop catalytic studies in water. And these are here examples of different ligands that uh, that uh, yeah, if I trying to no, this is not working because I, I could I could use this the mouse oh yes I can use the mouse yeah to show you so these are examples of hydrosoluble ligands that we have been applying here and I start with scorpionates uh, the name is nice I think it reminds you scorpion and so we will never forget about it the scorpion is there and so the name was given by Trofimenko a uh, Russian scientist, and uh, the ligand, the, you see the ligands, they can bite the metal in three ways, using, uh, we say in tridentate way, or in bidentate with that, uh, ex that substituent also coordinated to the metal. Anyhow, this reminds um, a scorpion, a scorpion grabbing its prey, yeah, with its arms and then its its tail as well. So that's why they are called uh, scorpionate scorpions or scorpionate ligands. So we can prepare a number of them, a number of complexes with them, and they are very good catalysts for alkane functionalization, oxidation, uh, for instance, of cyclohexane. Cyclohexane can be converted into cyclohexanol and cyclohexanone. And this reaction is important from an industrial point of view because it's used in industry. It's, and the mixture of cyclohexanol and cyclohexanone then, uh, well, uh, reacts further, as oxidized further, and is used for the, the production of nylon 66. So you can you can see the relevance of this. And our catalytic systems are much more effective than those of industry. And we operate under uh, milder conditions, usually uh, room temperature. And you see, in the, in industry, uh, typically you have 150 degrees. Yeah. And low yield, only 4% yield. In our case, we can have uh, quite high yields, as I, I will show you. And uh, in industry, the yield has to be low in order to guarantee a high, um, um, how do you call it, uh, selectivity, high selectivity towards the product that you want. Here, we can have also a very high selectivity with a, high, a very high yield. Okay. So this is just uh, one example, you see. Uh, with a vanadium catalyst, with one of those scorpionates, yeah. In this case, it's not cyclohexane, but is another uh, cyclic alkane, giving the corresponding alcohol and ketone. And we uh, use different transition metals there, 
nickel, iron, vanadium, copper, and to compare, and you can see that vanadium really can be quite effective initially, but then along the time, others like uh, iron and copper, they become really more efficient. So you see that along the time, the yield decreases. That's a bit strange, you can think, but probably decreased due to overoxidation. That is, the catalyst is too active, and so the alkaline and the ketone continue to be oxidized, eventually giving CO2 that you don't want. So this is a problem in alkane functionalization. You should have a catalyst that catalyzes only the first steps of alkane functionalization towards an alcohol ketone or carboxylic acid and stop there. Because the natural tendency is to go to CO2. That's what you get when, when you burn uh, an alkane. And we do not want that. Okay? We want to stop at a uh, uh, functionalized stage. That, that's the difficult part. Okay. Uh, we can have multinuclear complexes like that tetracopper comp uh, complex and uh, this reminds us particulate methane monoxygenase that is a multi-copper enzyme uh, is fundamental in the metabolic pathway of methanotrophs and in fact it catalyzes the same type of reaction oxidation of alkanes to corresponding alcohols and our uh, catalysts at least on a weight basis they are considerably more efficient than the enzyme itself. We can also have etro metallic compounds, as you can see an example here, of cobalt iron complexes on the, on the left, and they can be uh, prepared by what we call direct self-assembly, where we start from the metal itself, from cobalt. So this is a curious uh, type of preparation because you really start with the metal. Yeah, you do not need to elaborate the system. And so it's called direct self-assembly, and they can also be quite effective for this. And, but, uh, uh, we are typically using acetonitrile as solvent. That's an organic solvent. And so the question arises, would it be possible to eliminate the organic solvent in terms of sustainability? Would be useful that? Yes, the answer is yet if you replace it by an ionic liquid. An ionic liquid, as uh, the, the name indicates, is ionic compound like sodium chloride or so, but with a very low melting point. And so it can become a liquid at room temperature or not much higher, much higher than that. And by using this ionic liquid that you can, you can see here, the, in fact, you can replace the, totally the acetonitride by this and you have still a very active system. And with a number of advantages, you don't, not only to avoid the organic solvent, but also it's not necessarily an additive. And the selectivity of your reaction depends Selective relative selective of alcohol and ketone depends on the ionic liquid. And so by playing with ionic liquid, you can increase selective towards the alcohol or towards the ketone. And another important advantage is the possibility of recycling. That is, the catalyst really is soluble and stays in your ionic liquid. And so at the end of the reaction, you can recycle it without leaching, uh, without losing it. Yeah. And that uh, is, is explained there by those DFT calculations. Uh, on the right, that is the anion can coordinate to the metal, in this case is iron, and the cation yeah, can form through hydrogen bonds, can form a neutral adduct. So you have an, an outer sphere uh, unit here, and an associate, and its formation, as you can see by the calculation, is, very, is highly exergonic. So you get really a very stable species there with <coughs> a strong interaction, and then you can recycle your uh, ionic liquid with catalyst without losing it. And so this is a further advantage of the system. Because this, talk, this session usually concerns homogeneous catalysts. And for those who are not chemists, there is a difficulty in the end. In the end, when you convert your reagents into products, your catalyst, if it is a good one, is still active. But in a homogeneous system where you have only one phase, it's very difficult to separate catalysts. And so it will contaminate your product. So this is the main disadvantage of homogeneous catalysts. But by using this, then you really can separate the catalyst easily, as in heterogeneous catalysts. That's uh, the great advantage of heterogeneous catalysts. Another way to do it, another approach, is to, um, to uh, immobilize, to anchor our catalyst onto a surface, a matrix. And this is uh, an example that's the most effective uh, carbon uh, matrix that we found. The work was done in collaboration with Sonia Carabineiros, who is here, and uh, Dr. Sonia Carabineiros and Professor uh, Figueiredo, who is also here, yeah, uh, from Porto. And in fact, by previous treatment 
of the carbon nanotubes in order it's they are functionalized with suitable uh, centers that can coordinate to the metal for instance gold uh, complexes or iron complexes we can get supported catalysts that are also quite effective for the oxidation of alkanes and we can separate them very easily in the end and so this is also a technique that uh, method that we can use here these catalysts that operate for alkane functionalization can also be effective for other types of oxidation reactions, namely oxidations of xylenes. And you can see here the formula, of, uh, well, it is there, the formula of xylenes, this methyl group can be orthometa or para, and in fact, uh, the, 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 the main products are the corresponding acids, toluic acids. And if you have in para position the methyl in para position, this constitutes a first stage towards the phthalic acid, where you have two COOH groups in your product. And in fact, this system operates with many advantages over the system that works in industry. It's the industrial amoco system is homogeneous catalytic system using cobalt or manganese, but they, uh, that system operates in acetic acid. Acetic acid that is not the, the, the most convenient solvent, yeah, and vinegar, yeah, it operates in vinegar, and in the presence of bromide. And so HBr, this strong acid, is present there, yeah. And of course, in our system, we do, is halogen free, we do not have that, is added solvent free, it operates without any added solvent to the system, and still has a further advantage over the homogeneous system of industry, is the possibility of catalyst recycling. Okay? Because it is, the catalysts are anchored on the carbon nanotubes, nanotubes yeah, as I explained earlier. Yeah. Another method we, have been, uh, we start to apply is to use magnetic nanoparticles to help in the separation. You have here yeah, the magnetic uh, nanoparticles. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to, co to control the mouse. Yeah, it's here coated with silica, and then you can coordinate some transition metals there, and these nanoparticles can also catalyze our reaction, and in the end, they can, the catalyst can be very easily separated, as you can see here, with an external magnetic field. So very, very simple, and then you can uh, recycle it, re 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 uh, reuse it. Okay, so it's very, very handy system to operate. Concerning the mechanism, I'm not going into details, but just to draw your attention to the fact that it is radical. Usually, uh, is a radical-based mechanisms, mechanism involving oxygen and carbon radicals, and this can be accounted for by the formation of hydroxyl radical, that is there in red, uh, that comes from hydrogen peroxide. Well, but I, I'm sorry, I cannot find the mouse. Oh, it is. That's a strange mouse. Yeah. And also the alkyl radical, the organic radical that is formed by hydrogen abstraction from the hydroxyl from the alkane, given the alkyl radical. And then it, re it reacts with O2-dioxygen and the reaction proceeds. Proceed. We, we found that, of course, we want to optimize our systems, and we found that the catalytic activity can be promoted by acid. That we could understand. Uh, in terms of basic chemistry. But what we could not understand is that water could also promote the reaction, at least in some cases. So controlled amount of water could improve the, the reaction. How could that be occur? And also the nuclear character of the catalyst. If the catalyst was dinuclear, then it could be much more active than mononuclear catalyst. So how could we explain that? And the explanation comes in terms of cooperation, because there are some species that can cooperate with the metal, and there is a synergic effect that comes from there. So let us see first the effect of water. So on top, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not going through mechanism, but the mechanism uh, steps, some mechanistic steps involve transfer of protons from hydrogen peroxide, that is our oxidant, and other oxidal ligands that are in, the, in your metal. And this proton, this proton transfer could occur straight, in a straight way. But the activation energy is very high in direct way. But if you have a molecule of water there, you see it can form hydrogen bonds between your oxidant in red and between your oxidal ligand there, and forms this six-member transition state with a much lower energy. 
And so it speeds up the reaction, uh, well, in a very efficient way. And so in other steps, you could invoke again the role of water like this. And so water in a controlled amount can be very beneficial. And uh, th this is the explanation that we found for that. The case of the dinuclear compounds is exemplified here in the bottom for this divanadium oxo mu oxido catalyst. Here in this case, the proton migration, proton shift from oxidant, hydrogen peroxide, to the oxo ligand can occur to another atom. You see this oxo here is in another vanadium, not on the same one. So in this case, the, the characteristic, the feature of being dinuclear is very favorable because you do not need even water for this. Yeah? You, you can see that your hydrogen peroxide, this hydrogen atom uh, can shift to that oxide even without water because it forms this stable divanadium six-membered, six-member, like in benzene, you can think of benzene, gives a uh, well, uh, enhanced stability of your system, yeah. So this justifies why a dinuclear catalyst can be much more effective than a mononuclear one. And the trick is on transition states. So the system is able to stabilize transition states and then the uh, speed is much, is much higher. Yeah, it's like that we were having lunch at the uh, Geographical Society and we had this barrier to come to the, to the to the academy, this very high yield, yeah. If the academy would be down at the avenue of liberty, uh, of course, we could do it much, much quicker and without, without a car, yes, yeah, much less energy. That's the trick of the catalyst is really to, is one of them, one of the effects is decrease the energy of the transition states, okay. So this is for non-chemists, I apologize for the chemists, but I think. Other types of ligands, not only scorpionates, but other types of ligands can also be very effective. And uh, this is a curious example. It's azine. We call it azine. It has this unsaturated group, carbon nitrogen, or other people call hydrozones. And we observe that, for instance, some vanadium complex, divanadium, were very active in the system. Okay, we can explain that by nuclear character. And the ligand, we could also consider a number of effects of the ligand, but that could be beneficial to the catalytic activity. But there are other ligands, apart from azines, that don't work in an effective way. So something, there should be an extra role played by azines in this. And in fact, the extra role concerns the redox activity of these ligands. They can undergo oxidation or reduction and replace the metal in this job. And so the metal is not necessary. This part, this action of the metal or for electron transfer because ligand can do it. Yeah. And so the process can be quite favorable under these circumstances. This is an example. Uh, I'm showing it because it's very recent. It's a collaboration with Professor Vladimir Ryan. Yeah. He prepared the complex and we studied the catalytic activity. And you can see the, the, this nickel complex. It has a number of diazines. And here is the composition of the LUMO is the lowest unoccupied uh, molecular orbital, and it is mainly localized at the ligand. Not at the metal, but at the ligand. And when you reduce it, you see that in reduced species, the spin density is also mainly localized at the ligand. And so the electron goes to the ligand, not to the metal. And so this really can explain the high catalytic activity of the system. And here is just a, a cyclic tomogram where you see this reduction wave of your complex that is localized at ligand and not at the metal. Uh, chemists, at least coordination chemists, tend to think about the metals. Yeah, everything happens the metal, oxidation, reduction, but it, not always. The ligand can have a very important uh, role. And in fact, the electron transfer can be localized in some case at ligand and not at the metal. And so this is the case of these azine ligands. And in fact, we have extra evidence for that. For instance, catalytic activities increase with the ease of the reduction of the ligand. That sounds very well for this explanation. And this is one of the steps, one of the key steps of the mechanism, mechanistic uh, proposal that I not discussed, just this step. You see that this is a step where the oxidant is oxidized by your catalyst. So initially, we thought always oh, oxidized by nickel. So the oxidation state of nickel should be nickel one in the product, nickel, from nickel two to nickel one. No, nickel stays nickel two because the uh, oxidation of the, of the 
your um, uh, initial molecule of reagent, tibutal hydroperoxide, yeah, is done by the ligand itself. And so it's the ligand that is reduced there. Okay. So this is a new approach, is a, really is an example of a new approach in alkane functionalization, where you can have a good cooperation between your metal and your ligand by using redox active, we say non-innocent ligands, where they can play an important role. Other types of catalysts for its coordination polymers. Yeah, you have a polymer, but with a metal in some points. Not only an organic polymer, but with a metal. So there's a, se a sequence of uh, complexes, molecules, yeah, forming your polymer. They can also be quite active. For this, this vanadium complexes, with, uh, they are driven by alkali metals, sodium, potassium, and uh, cesium. And in fact, we found a periodical trade here. You see the increase of coordination number, there are many waters here of the uh, alkali metal, the increase follows from sodium to potassium and cesium. You can see here the coordination number, number of coordinated waters, and that follows the ionic radius. That's okay, the larger the radius, more molecules it can stand, the, the metal, and also the increasing complexity of the coordination polymer. The top one with sodium is just one frame, one dimension, the other one is two-dimensional, yeah, it's two surface, and the other one is three-dimensional coordination polymer, very uh, complex. And the, the activity, catalytic activity, follows this order as well. Yeah. Also, high nuclearity clusters, like this one that was prepared by our colleagues at INEOS. You see it's, it's a cage with nine coppers, uh, six sodiums, and there are many silicons, yeah, uh, 10 or two sets of 10 silicons or so, yeah. They are a lot of very complex, and in fact, it can also work in this cage, yeah. The active species, yeah, is somehow protected, and it also uh, can control selectivity somehow, yeah. And then we did some experiments with O18 oxygen labeled, and the, well, by analyzing the products, uh, we got another evidence for the mechanism that we were proposing, but without further details. Well, to aiming towards rich increase in sustainability of our systems, we also uh, take care of other approaches, yeah, other methodologies. Uh, one of them is use of microwave irradiation. If you use microwave irradiation in your system, you can uh, accelerate the reaction in some cases, and we have applied many times. Another way that we start to apply very recently is through mechanochemical. We use a meal, planetary, mill, yeah, that is, well, is shown on the right, where there are a number of spheres, they rotate in different directions, they shake and so on, and that mechanical energy is transferred to your, to your system. And then, in fact, we can increase the activity of your system by this, and in fact, by using this mechanochemical energy input, you can apply it in the preparation of the catalyst on the left, and also during the reaction. And you can see, although, we have different combinations here on the left, and this one is particularly interesting because you apply in a single pot, yeah, you apply the, the, your mechanochemical approach, your mill, yeah, you uh, apply it for the preparation of the sample on the left, yeah, and also for the reaction itself. And you can see the yield is not much lower than the best one we we, we got using, using the uh, microwave. And uh, in this case, by using the combination just with the, the ball milling, in fact, it's at room temperature. We do not heat well, the system at room temperature. And a single pot, so we do not have to, to uh, let us say, to prepare the catalyst and then separate, well, take it and use. No, we can do everything in a single pot. And so there are many advantages, yeah, and also without solvent. We do it solid state without any solvent. And so many advantages on the use of a mechanochemical approach. So that deserves to be further explored. But we are just starting with this. So these methods in this field are non-conventional. And so we are just starting to apply them. Yeah. And we can also find very unconventional catalysts for this reaction. Yeah. And it involves redox steps in the mechanism. I, I already mentioned to you that the ligand can 
replace the metal on that. So we can think of other metals out of a transition state because the metals on transition state on the middle of periodic table, they can change the oxidation state very easily, but not the others. Yeah. But if we use a suitable ligand, then they can also become active in, the, in your system. And this is a, uh, a nice example is on bismuth. And I just draw your attention for this intermediate here. It's just a bismuth salt that we, we use, bismuth nitrate or so, dissolved in water. Yeah, it forms the aqua complex of bismuth full of water. And here, a coordination, well, uh, hydrogen peroxide coordinates to the metal. One proton jumps, as I explained to you. Then a second molecule of hydrogen peroxide also coordinates to the bismuth. Bismuth in the oxidation state plus three. And then here, this OOH minus ligand reduces, yeah, reduces the hydrogen peroxide and forms the hydroxy radical. And without direct involvement of bismuth in that process, in that redox process. So bismuth is in the oxidation state always three, as you would expect. And so and this process works, initially was found for aluminum, and now through the calculations by Maxim Kuznetsov, well, he's, he's, he considered that it's not only aluminum, also metals of group 15, bismuth, and also of group three, lanthanides, and so they, in principle, they should do it. And we tried in the experiment, and it worked, they worked. And so this is a case where theoretical studies had a predictive value. So for those who don't believe theoretical studies, no, you should do, I, I am a believer now. And we went to the laboratory, and really it, it worked. In this mechanism, you see water entering and going out and abstracting a proton and releasing a proton. And so water can have really a very effective role here as a Levite ligand and also taking advantage of its unphotetic character. Yeah. No, this is not going. So if you think of one of my first slides, we would like to use water as solvent, full stop, and we would be very happy. But along studies, we found that it can be used not only as water, but can have much more interesting roles than a mere solvent. In fact, it can be a catalyst for proton shifts. Remember that six-member transition state, yeah? It can be a labile ligand or an S on a base that uh, we would see if we would discuss in detail the mechanism. And it can also be a functionalizing agent of the alkane. So water itself can go can functionalize your alkane. And so this, I think, was also an interesting result. And the reactions indicated here is hydrocarboxylation of alkanes, where in a single pot, you start with your alkane on the, on the left, you carbonylate with carbon monoxide in the presence of water, and that's, you need an oxidant. It's the best oxidant is peroxide isulfate. That's indicated there. And you get a carboxylic acid on your right. And the OH group of your carboxylic acid the source of that group is water, and we prove by using, uh, by doing experiments using O18 labeled water and O18 hydroxyl group is there in the end. So, in a, uh, low, well, in very mild conditions, we can hydrocarboxylate, and in a single pot, you convert an alkane into a product with a very high added value, a carboxylic, a carboxylic acid. So, the, well, the mechanism comes further, but. Uh, of course, I'm going out, uh, jump over it. Now, the question, yeah. The solvent that we used there was a mixture of water acetonitrile. It's the best solvent. Then the question, can we eliminate acetonitrile? Yes, by an ionic liquid again. And so, you see here, the co in the composition there, yeah, we can have acetonitrile, I say there, on the top of the arrow, acetonitrile or ionic, uh, ionic liquid. This is an example of ionic liquid. And so we can really uh, do it using this instead of, of course, water is always necessary because it's hydroxylating agent, yeah. So advantages, again, recyclability. We can easily recycle our catalyst, solving the ionic uh, liquid, and uh, we can also control, we can get a higher selectivity than when using uh, acetonitrile in this particular case. And this is the catalyst. It's a coordination polymer. Yeah, it's 1D, one dimension coordination polymer based on nitrogen ligands, terpiridine ligands with carboxylate groups. And so these are features, of course, with green, signif green significance towards sustainability. These systems are the constituted development of others that we, we, <laughs> we studied. Carboxylation reactions of alkanes indicated there, but using trifluoracetic acid, 
at 80 degrees trifluoroacetic acid as a solvent. And these conditions were really pioneered by Professor Fujivar in Fukuoka. And he found uh, very interesting catalysts of palladium and copper. But then we found that vanadium could be much better and much more efficient. And the mechanism really is very different from the mechanism of, uh, that he, he found, he proposed. And a typical catalyst is indicated here as amvadin, is this vanadium compound here with this nitrogen oxygen ligands. And it is present in uh, amanita. Some very beautiful mushrooms, Amanita muscaria, and they, are, they have this catalyst. So we do not extract them from mushroom, we synthesize and lab and, and apply it. But anyhow, it is there. These are some very beautiful pictures. Be careful because they are uh, poisons. Yeah. Uh, you have two types on the right, they are edible. Yeah. On the further right, and on the middle, they are poisonous, like this one. I don't know what happened to this animal who, who bite this one, but became hallucinogenic, probably. This is a picture I took in Poland, yeah. And, and so, this, anyhow, very nice pictures I, I brought in France. This from the embankment of Siena. That one is a big table, is a big picture, yeah, that I took. I bought it there and is now in my office there. Uh, the mechanism, also without details, yeah, is also, a, a, just to show you, that is a, a radical mechanism, yeah, operates under mild conditions. What I want to stress now is the simplicity of the system. Very simple. In one pot, you start with the alkane, for instance, methane, and the press of carbon monoxide, and you get acetic acid. If you compare with the industrial process, it's our process is very, very simple. The, the industrial process has three separate stages. They can even occur in different factories. Yeah, different plants. First one is steam reforming from methane or from coal, yeah? And you form CO plus uh, dihydrogen. Then you rearrange the composition and you have the synthesis gas. And on second one, second step, synthesis gas, you generate methanol. This is the first and the second heterogeneous catalyst very high temperatures, very high pressures, a lot of energy is being lost here. And then the, you convert uh, methanol by carbonylation finally to acetic acid. This in industry usually is an homogeneous process by Monsanto, Monsanto or Cativa process, depending on the catalyst, using uh, expensive noble catalyst. Also, the conditions are not mild, are, are uh, well above 100 degrees, 120 or something like that. So you can see that our system is much, much simpler and operates in much sustainable conditions than what uh, the, the industrial uh, system. But we still need to use a less toxic solvent because initially we used trifluoroacetic acid as solvent, the best one. But now we can replace it by acetonitrile water or ionic liquid water. And so I think uh, this is also convinces industry that we have a, a very promising system. But it would also be nice to replace the oxidant. The best oxidant is peroxidized sulfate. That is also not very attractive from an, uh, an industrial point of view. So we recently succeeded in replacing it by a very simple and very convenient oxidant, ozone. Yeah. Ozone can be generated in situ and used immediately. Yeah. And in fact, we found that in the presence of that iron catalyst, Ozone can oxidize alkanes to the corresponding alcohols and ketones. And in particular, if we start with cyclohexane, yeah, the oxidation does not stop at the alcohol and the ketone stage. It continues, continues, and gives a dipic acid. And the dipic acid really is further, is a further intermediate for nylon, precursor for nylon. And so in a single step, in a single process, we can go to a very close precursor of nylon, yeah, that's a dipic acid. It just precipitates and separates under very mild conditions. And this also has other advantage over the industrial process because in industry, when you, as I mentioned to you, from cyclohexane, you get this mixture of alcohol ketone and then you have to oxidize it, this step, to oxidize to the acid. And for this oxidation, you need to use nitric acid. And nitric acid then forms huge amounts of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a laughing gas, so it's toxic and also is ozone scavenger. Okay? And so here 
the emission of N2O is zero. We simply do not use nitric acid, it's zero, and so our system is N2O free, so it's also free of nitric acid, it operates at room temperature, so it's heating free, radiation free, because other groups did this reaction, but they needed strong irradiation, so we do not need it. And so it's very, very simple, and uh, of course, it is very promising, and I think we should, we should really invest more in ozone and oxidation reactions. So to finalize, I hope that I've shown you some examples that show our steps towards functionalization of alkanes, where they can be converted into organic products with a high added, added value like acids, well, alcohols, ketones, acids, including adipic acid, yeah. And some of the systems operate without organic solvent, so they are organic solvent-free. Others are solvent-free, even without acid, they can, and uh, without the transition metal in, in, in some cases. The role of water is multiple, so water really <laughs> can be used not only as a solvent, but as a reagent, even as a reagent, as a catalyst for proton shifts, and so on. And the catalysts themselves, yeah, they can be hydrosoluble, or they can be supported on, uh, remember, the carbon, uh, multi, the, the carbon nanotubes. They can involve uh, a central metal, that's a transition metal, or a non-transition metal. And so really, it can go over the periodic table, yeah, and sometimes it's bio-inspired, and so think of particulate methane monoxygenase and AMVAD in, in Amanita uh, muscaria, yeah. I also draw your attention for the, uh, well, for the role, the important role of radical mechanism, of the FT calculations as well, and of cooperation, cooperative effects between ligand and reagents and your metal, and so think that things can be really centered, not only on your metal, but in other places of the molecule. So, uh, concerning the question, my first question is that, are we really moving into an alkane era for the uh, organic synthesis? Uh, many years ago was a acetylene era, then became ethylene era, so unsaturated molecules. Are we moving now to the saturated ones? <laughs> and using methane, natural gas, and so, to produce an array of added values. Well, the, you please feel free to give your own answer uh, after this, yeah. And uh, I should thank uh, the co-workers. Their names were in the papers, yeah, who have contributed for this. Of course, they have done the work, not, not myself. And since this is catalysis, we are talking about catalysis on this session, uh, let me take the opportunity to invite all of you for the International Symposium on Homogeneous Catalysis that will be held here in Lisbon. We are organizing it at the moment. You can see it the, at the website, yeah. And don't forget also that catalysis is very important. Uh, remember the sentence I used in the beginning of the US uh, Department of Energy about the importance of catalysis is the most relevant contribution of chemistry towards sustainability, yeah? And in fact, the relevance of catalysis and of catalysts is becoming now, uh, well, well known, is becoming, yeah? And th there is a, some perception, public perception of this role. And now you can see names of restaurants with catalyst. There is a restaurant in, for instance, uh, I, I think I, I made this, I don't know. Yeah, you can see that one. That Catalyst is the best branch in Boston, yeah? It's called Catalyst. You can see the Druid Magic Potion and Popeye's Spinach, all that is Catalysis, yeah. And even there is, I, I, I do not show the picture, but there is a, a marriage magazine called Catalyst. So thank you for, for your attention. Yeah. Okay. So we are short of time, but but yeah, it, it you can. Be a yeah. Very long session. So, so I don't want to impose on any of you any more time than you have already devoted to. But I would allow one or two really questions, not not extra presentations. Just questions, by all means. Well, so one over there. You show the number of cases where the uh, systems uh, which you indicated were better 
than those used by industry. Now, why is that? Kind of an industrial inertia? Why do the... Yeah, no, no, alkanes okay, okay, are... Alkane, alkanes are very inert, yeah. As, and so the trick, you see, the, we are playing with our catalysts with mechanisms that are different. Catalysts that are different from those in industry. Yeah. So very different in concept. And uh, also we are taking advantage of some effects that the industrial systems do not have. But it's very difficult to replace an industrial system by another one that is totally, totally different, that the scientific bases are, are very different. And so, uh, of course, our systems has, have already raised some attention of industry. And uh, we have a, an example also with China, with one of probably the major producer of a CTCAS was apparently very interested. But when, and we made a protocol of collaboration and so on, but when we reached the stage to do a scale up, and that was their job. I indicated clearly that my job was just science, nothing else. They disappeared. So I don't know if they are producing a CTK acid really with our catalysts. I have no way of, of uh, well, I could have, but I don't have patience or time or so to, to do it. Yeah. And, and, but so why our are, are better? Let's just say they are better because they operate under milder conditions, lower temperature, with a higher yield higher selectivity, and so they, they really are much more sustainable than those, and they're much simpler, much, much simpler. Usually they are one pot processes. So the explanation, scientific explanation lies, of course, in a number of details, but basically it's because our catalysts have a different concept than those, those traditional use that are being used now, nowadays in industry. Yeah. Thank you. Certainly a very substantial contribution. Any further question? We also, uh, we also use dioxygen in some, in some reactions. I think it has a number of difficulties. I, I also discussed that point with some people from industry. Uh, at least those, those people to whom I talked, they were not very impressed with O2. Because when you use O2 under pressure in industry, safety, you have really safety problems. So they are much more pleased with ozone, for instance. Ozone. They are much more interested in ozone or even on a solid or liquid catalyst. Hydrogen peroxide, aqueous hydrogen peroxide, as we are using, is a, a, a very, very mild and very, very pleasant, very attractive oxidizing agent. Dioxygen forms um, explosive mixtures with methane. And so you have to be very careful. And be, of course, you can work during one month or one year or 10 years without anything, or at your first experiment, it can explode. So you really have to control relative amounts of O2 and methane, and that's not easy to do, yeah, in order to avoid any risks of explosion. So that is a, a serious problem, and so a serious limitation is safety of O2, yeah. So the, I'm not really with it now, I did not mention here, we have also, mainly with vanadium, yeah, catalysts, and we managed to, to do carboxylation reactions, yeah, where using the oxidizing, and oxidation react using O2, uh, instead of peroxidized sulfate, they can work, yeah. But you, you have to eat, not so mild, you have to go higher, higher temperatures, yeah. But there is this risk, at the moment we stopped that experiment. Any further questions? No, I don't think so. So, I have to thank the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you especially, Herman, for organizing the session. That was very nice again, too. And, uh, well, what was the session now? Uh, oh, okay. There, I think Herman has something there hidden for you to see. But you, ha you, ca you can walk over there. It's very close. It's an unusual version of the periodic table. More artistic, but also <laughs> science-based. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation.